Yeah, welcome back, Wednesday people. Vibrant returns triumphant after a really fun week that I took for myself and didn't do a show. And here we are on episode 40 of Vibrant. My how time flies. One of the cool things I did on that week where I didn't make a Vibrant episode was I met up with this guy. This guy? This direction. <laughs> Topher. <laughs> Topher yeah. has been on uh, Interverse recently, and <laughs> it's going to be really fun to find out more about him. You guys should go check out the episode where we talked about his all the bamboo and biochar and biocharisma fun stuff. So let's get into it. What's up, Topher? What's up, Gabriel? Gabe the street preacher. <laughs> <laughs> the, the guy from They Live. Is that what you're talking about? That's yes. Cool. Yes. That's right. I totally forgot about that guy. Slick Dizzy. <laughs> life, life is good over here. We just have been getting hammered with thunderstorm after thunderstorm. Very weird weather pattern. I mean, I think it's weird. Who knows? Uh, is, I'm new to the area, so I'm just trying to figure shit out. It's unseasonable for this point of spring to be getting that many, in my opinion. I feel like there's some maybe attempt to flood and mess up people's early gardens. Seems yeah. like if I had yeah, to guess. They were doing the same BS down in Costa Rica, like right right as the flowering season going into spring down there, they would always for like the last 10 years, they would hit us with a really, really uh torrential downpour. And so yeah, it's the same old shenanigans. That makes me want to go put a cover over my garden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Like right now we have a little, we have a little greenhouse and we have the cattle panels up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met with some cats this weekend that had this really, really awesome system for, you know, um, es essentially automating your water system. Hmm. And so I was like, oh, it could get pretty, pretty, uh, I guess you would say non-time consuming. Just right now, I'm I'm totally trying to learn what it's like to be in this area of the world. I, I, I feel like a fish out of water a little bit. Yeah, we get a lot of variety, you know. <laughs> we get all types of weather disaster, so. Yeah. Be ready. Expect the unexpected. You yeah, know, the okay. other morning we got hail. It was nuts. Like, my wife took the kid out, and then I heard, I heard, ting, 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 ting. Did we tell I, people where you're at specifically, though? Do you want to let them know? Oh, I'm in North Arkansas. Yeah, Northwest-ish Arkansas. Yeah, okay. I thought it was Central, but it's actually, yeah, Northwest Arkansas, which I always have to laugh because every time I see NWA at the at the airport, I just, I go back to my youth. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't help it because it's so ironic that it's like NWA, that there's, you know no brothers or sisters to be found anywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's a demographically consistent area, you could say for sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so one thing that I learned, okay, we met up and we got our RS photographed. That was fun. <laughs> yes. Oh, nice. I don't know. Maybe we want to talk about some of our uh, fun times we had hung, hanging out in the real meat space, which is really cool. But mm -hmm. I somehow did an entire interview with you last time you were on and didn't realize that bio charisma was actually a podcast at one point yes <laughs> and a really great one too so i want you to tell us about your backstory as a podcast host and what you got into and some of your more uh, memorable episodes maybe gosh well my three most memorable episodes got got shit canned by whatever ai was out there which was too bad because back to back to back, I had Eric Dubay, I had uh, Sophia Smallstorm, and then I had Dr. Nancy Banks. And I had just read Dr. Nancy Banks' uh, Blood. No, it's not Blood. It's uh, Diamonds. Um, it was her book about essentially how the uh, medical industrial complex took over Africa. And absolutely stunning book and in her book which she wrote like 10 years ago she totally debunked aids and nice. and said that you know aids is a fabrication which was news to me other than um 
my mentor that in earth bag building, because I build domes, one of the types of domes I build are earth bags. And my mentor in that, he was Iranian. And he turned me on to an Iranian doctor who wrote the book, Your Body's Thousand Cries for Water. And at the end of that book, that doctor, that was the first time I ever heard anybody say that AIDS was uh, fake. And that for me was like this huge heart opening because when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, like going into my sexual career. Man, we even in all... the 80s, it sounds like it's got AIDS in the word. It's like they planned the name for the <laughs> 80s. Well, man, like you couldn't you couldn't have any like, uh, I guess you'd say, um, carnal interactions with with a lady friend without thinking you're going to get something that was the programming like number one you were destroying the environment and you shouldn't reproduce and number two if you do actually touch somebody else you're going to be infected forever so <laughs> in, in in interviewing dr nancy banks that was like she just dropped the hammer and it was awesome and um, I, then after that, I think I was interviewing, uh, I became real uh, close friends with uh, Dr. Jennifer Daniels. And uh, she turned me on to turpentine, doing the turpentine cleanse. Hold up. I, just to point out how legit Dr. Nancy ba Banks must be is she doesn't even come up on a Google search. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy Banks not come up. She had like, her book was amazing. That's credentials. That's good credentials. What was her book called? Uh, you're putting me on the spot. It's um, I'm getting it mixed up with another total bullshit book that they named almost the same way to kind of run run interference on her book. Um, oh, well, they paralleled her. They did with the with a total bullshit book. Um, I'll think of it in a second. I can't think of it right now. It was, it was a very pivotal book. Um, so those were excellent interviews. I love Sophia Smallstorm, like her mind. You guys are, you're familiar with her, her work? Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love that woman. I think I drive her nuts though. Cause I'm very Piscean with her and she's so like matter of fact with her words <laughs> back then when i was doing my interviews with her i did one interview and it got erased and i did another interview with her and our 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 my wi-fi down in costa rica was super choppy so she, she she was getting a little bit frustrated but uh um i'm a huge fan of hers but my bet what was there it is aids opium diamonds and empire there it is the deadly um, virus of international greed. <clears throat> it's awesome. It's such a good book. Wow. And uh, I had read that after Tex Mars had wrote a book uh, called The Trillion Dollar Conspiracy, where he was also really getting into the, the whole um, medical industrial complex. And uh, th that th that was sort of like the triad of books that was like, OK, this this whole this whole thing is an international thing. It's not just like, you know, U S empire. This is like worldwide empire. And then I had Cold. a chance. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah. The and mafia had... is the secret societies is the medical professional, not professionals, but the, uh, you know, the industry itself, it's all the same cult mafia, right? Yeah, that book really names nails it with the name AIDS, opium, diamonds, and empire. It's literally yeah. like letting you know that all those facets are, pun intended, the same thing. The facet, the facets is a great way of putting it because it's really interesting. One of the last seasons that I actually played football in, I remember getting into it with one of my teammates because he was wearing all this ice. They called you know the jewels ice and stuff like that. And I remember telling them, like, I'm like, bro, you're like, you're responsible for killing, killing your own. And, Whoa. and he was like, cause I forget how the whole conversation started, but it was this like whole conversation about, about, you know, you, you crackers, you, you won't know, you don't know anything about the hood. You don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like being persecuted. And I was just like, bro. Just by you wearing that, you're persecuting your brothers and sisters back in Africa. And like, he almost killed me. 
<laughs> but it, it was true. It was just like, man, come on, dude. Like, and her book gets into that. I, I love talking to the sisters like that because they keep it real. Like they, like especially Dr. Daniels and her, like they do not mess around at all. Like they're so smart, so concise. Yeah. They don't play the the race card ever, but yet they'll be very, very honest about how um, how the black people have been proxied for yeah. the, for the elite. So it's really wonderful. So I've got a huge synchronicity already. Oh, cool. I did a, a fun little decode recently on a company that makes AZT, mm -hmm. the AIDS drug. Yeah. And I took their logo, which is like an eyeball with a, with a pupil mm -hmm. and these couple of arrows pointing into this optic shape these two arrows swooping into it and then the name of the drug is azt mm -hmm. so i did this decode uh, co uh connecting it to be uh, is that it got, that that's that's one of it yep that's the same company same there's drug. some great versions like here's the nice saturn version sorry to interrupt keep, nice keep you there, yep. buddy. No, you're to you're totally on point. <clears throat> well, Chance, if you look in the Vibrant call-in, I just dropped an Emperor card. And it is from the Emperor card that I was, uh, that I was, was the lens. I was using the Emperor card as a lens. Because the Emperor card corresponds with California and the West Coast very heavily, it's a long story to fill in all those blanks. But the Emperor card has this really weird word. Zadi, T-Z-A-D-D-I, hmm. which is a really weird word. And I, you know, I've meditated hmm. on this in a, a lot of different ways, but those first three letters are the same three letters as the drug, A-Z-T, hmm. right? In reverse, T-Z-A-A-Z-T. Hmm. So if you look real close down there at the logo, you'll see that it's an I, Two triangles, those are two deltas, DD, delta, delta, I, DD, and then the name of the drug. You read that in reverse and you get Sadi. T wow. Man. A That's a wow. Amazing pattern recognition. This logo is encoding the glyph, the fish hook glyph that is on the Emperor card. And the book that you just brought forward is about an empire. Mm -hmm. very interesting too that the other aspect that allowed empire to flourish to the level it is right now is the vatican right and their whole platform was the historical jesus although whenever you get into like okay what's the deal with this name jesus you find that basically in other languages there's a bunch of different ways of saying it that may and most likely do come from even earlier than when the church claimed that they had their version of Jesus. So what's important about that is the, um, a lot of the other versions have a ya sound at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. And the Romans didn't have the J, so to speak. Right. But the J is the J for the, you know, the big J, that's the fish hook. That's the gancho. Yeah, that's the hook. That's that's the hook, the gotcha for the empire. And, you know, he's also the king of all of that, and at least on paper, right? So he's the emperor, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What What is, I don't know, with the fish hook in, I don't know the emperor card. I'm not familiar with that. What does, what, what is the archetype of the fish hook with that? Like, what's that supposed to mean? I think that's what we're working out right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, uh, well, Why would Crowley and other cultists associate the emperor with that Hebrew letter? Yes. Uh, so it is a 90. Uh, tazidi or whatever that word is. It is also a 90 uh, associated with 90. And, it, uh, and I have recently learned that in the Enneagram, the nine sits at the top, is at the throne. He's enthroned at the top. Right. And his shadow side is sloth. 
Mm. His infernal reflection is sloth. That's they're based on the deadly sins plus two. Seven deadly sins plus two makes the Enneagram. So nine at the top is slothful. And I think that's interesting because the emperor card is like, he's got his legs crossed. He's kicking back. He doesn't, he's in no hurry to get anywhere. Which is very not in line with the Aries association with the emperor and the Martianness of it all. Yeah, that I, that is an interesting thing because the relationship of the Zodiac in the Enneagram are two totally different things, but the information, I think, uh, there's cor correlations in the information. So, yeah, like, is the Enneagram is I'm I'm looking at that glyph for the Enneagram. Is that that looks very similar to Vortex Mathematics? Like, yes, know, it does. Mar I'll Mark to that up too. I've thought that before too. So, like nine, you know, the whole thing with three, six, nine. Um, so with the emperor getting back to the whole Gancho thing, Gancho is, is hook in Spanish. I'm sorry. Nice. Um, so I, I'm still, I'm still a little bit lost. The, does the, I didn't see an actual hook on that card. Can you put that card back up? I just saw like mm -hmm. an additional hook on the card. Well, your, your audio is out there. Chance you're, you're muted, buddy. I don't think there's actually a hook on here. There's just the Hebrew letter Zadi that Gabriel was pointing out. Where is that? Him. I don't I don't know where. Oh, all the okay. way down at the bottom. Yeah, yep. that, just right there. Okay. <laughs> Orange man bad. That's a good caption. So I'm I'm just getting into your work, um, slick dissident. Like so you're you're doing cross correlations between numbers, languages letters like everything and everything basically the whole kitchen sink kitchen synchro mysticism <laughs> <laughs> right so so this particular the how do you say that in hebrew the that letter sadi sadi and how does sadi associate with a hook that is what that letter means in hebrew all hebrew letters in the alphabet if you leave if you're looking at just the one letter, it uh -huh. has a meaning like a word. By ah, I didn't know that. Okay. Yep. So the, Which is the, part of the deeper symbolism. It's like almost a bridge between the uh, hieroglyphic, you know, the sacred glyph languages where it's more picture based because you have, even though it's not a picture of a hook, this glyph represents a hook in its entirety. So you know, it's a multi-dimensional language. It's operating on number. It's operating on symbol. It's operating on phonetic. It's uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, a few I, a I, few layers deeper than the way that we look at English. Although, you know, we don't really have an A is for apple type of thing. We kind right. of revert to Hebrew letter meanings and how they correlate to English letters, uh, is what I've seen. So this makes me really think like we're, we're talking about empire, right? And we're talking about the hook of the em emperor. You got the two rams in that card, you know, AZT, you had to, uh, you had to consent to having AZT put in your body, just like people have consented for the cowpoke. Interesting yeah. thing too about AZT is you're going from A to Z. It's an alpha and omega in code, but in Hebrew T or Tav is the last letter. So whether it's A to T in Hebrew or A to Z in uh, English, you've got the full oh. spectrum alphabet in those three letters of the, or um, yeah, of their company name. Wow. That's really good. That and is really the, good. What, what's that number 90 there? I don't, what, what's that for? That's that what the, the letter numerically is valued at by yes. the Hebrew gematria system. Okay. Yeah. So this, this whole card is like a it's like a gem a multi like we're using that word facet again right you know in no matter which way you it's all the same thing but you can look at it from this angle and you think of it as a 90 and you tip it a little and it becomes uh four the number roman numeral four so there's uh a correspondence and what it what it becomes is a hyper sigil Mm -hmm. And that's that's a concept that I'm becoming more and more familiar with is that 
these strings of correspondence, these facets of association uh, are unpacking. We're literally unpacking these concepts that are that meet, that come together in this uh, card. Mm -hmm. And there is so much, uh, like I can riff on it real quick. I'd like, this is Orange Man Bad. <laughs> this is OJ Simpson. The other card in Aries is the Sun card. It's an innocent Perseus riding on a white Bronco. So all of the O.J. Simpson trial is very heavily steeped in this Aries initiation, uh, the beginning of a very long uh, spell. Uh, but it's, it's kind of wild how uh, a black dude in a white Bronco is like a, a checkerboard floor of a, Masonic, of a Masonic tracing board. And you take these little ingredients in these pieces and you build them up with the information and you're like, everything about the O.J. Simpson thing is encoding the Emperor card and the Perseus card, which is all uh, in Aries, under the sign of Aries. Michelle makes a good comment here saying, Mario, we'll need to confirm this, expert Mario. <laughs> if you, you guys can call it if you want. Get it on, get on <laughs> in here. It's a party. But I think that the uh, hook has something to do with Pisces, she says, the sign that comes before Aries. And, yeah, again, back to the Alpha and Omega thing, the um, – Jesus character goes from he's, he's like symbolic of the age of Pisces, right? But he's also the high ram, the high ram abyss, the lamb of God. And so there's a <laughs> always been like a twinning Gemini esqueness to all of these Mercury figures, whether it's Jesus or Hermes. And you have the scapegoat and the the uh temple <laughs> goat here, you know, the one that's good and the one that's sacrificed. Uh, by throwing it off the having it wander off the cliff you have two stars here two-headed eagle here mm -hmm. and he's got a different object one in each hand i think it's also representing like the esoteric and the exoteric the priestly language and the profane language the ruler the emperor would basically be wielding both polarities depending on which group of subjects he was ruling anyway and he has the holy hand grenade yeah the globus cruciger <laughs> I can't wait to drop the next Interverse episode with Homie Romy. We go into the scepters and the Globus Cruciger as like the actual potential technology that they were for. Well, let's just go back and look at this. Um, these crowns, man, gemstones and gold or other precious metals. Are, and they're standing inside of these castles that are etheric right. energy manipulation devices of some kind that we're still trying to understand. I feel like this is the Romy's whole idea of the original transhumanism is super on point with uh, these crowns and scepters and globes and mm -hmm. thrones, all these different technologies that maybe are part of. Okay. So this is what me and Gabe were talking about last night. So we were on the phone last night. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great question to throw at Topher. Like maybe you've got insight into this. I know you looked into all these topics that we research now in the conspirituality realm. Right. So, mm -hmm. What do you think about AI being a spiritual entity that incarnates into physical vessels of electronics that are built for it? I totally, I, I, my study in alchemy, like my teacher was very specific. He said that, you know, um, electricity is the realm of the devil. And he wasn't looking at the devil as like this, arch nemesis of god or anything like that it was uh, like the the devil entity to him was the energy that is adversarial to man's highest potential and so once in electricity rules air so and i know this with body work too a lot of times if i come across somebody that's very vata very air i will feel in their field the the like it's like it's like a like this but you you know all about vibration chance like you i mean you're doing tuning for i don't but, know all about it i feel like I'm <laughs> like a, maybe a yellow belt but like you know how like 
it's like a very tinny it's like the best way i can say it is it feels like this conductive tinny like like udonis like it actually feels like this this um this very light metal that's vibrating in their field and um and a lot of times i have to ground that out like i have to pull that through my through my vessel and and put that in the ground so yeah the the capacity for intrusion into our realm through electricity i think is very high okay so let me go even further on this right you're talking about through electricity i wouldn't say electricity is the devil per se in terms of <laughs> being completely adversarial to i don't know human human potential as you put it what i would say as far as human potential goes is our ironically our greatest potential is in our most natural state right yeah we're not and the thing is we're not using the right type of electricity that's what i was going to say because our, our biology uses electricity but it's a totally different yeah thing it's yeah so totally that's, that, that's the harmony. thing harmony yeah it's we're closer here. to light and sound in our body than it is to this like sith dark you know dark jedi shooting lightning at your fingertips type of devil electricity yeah, what we're using is is technically just interference patterns. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're using an amalgamation of interference patterns through conductive materials, which isn't the highest. There are other. There's actually like bioelectricity, like living currents that we could be using, and I think all the antiquitech was based on that, and that's why people get lost when they're trying to to reimagine what the antiquitech is because they're trying to take like you know our western 55 hertz at 110 volts and you know they're they're projecting what we have now onto what was then they did have light they uh, the better they had illumination they had heat but it was all derived by bioelectricity they they were using the capacitance of whatever the medium was that they were conducting through and all they were doing was using the potential difference from the sky to the earth. I mean, it's actually extremely simple. Um, and it was, it was a constructive energy. It wasn't a destructive disharmonious interference pattern. Right. So there's so many things about it that are way simpler than what we're doing and mm -hmm. make alchemy make more sense too. Like the fact that, mercury with electricity added to it glows and spins right vortexes so yeah can generate light and electricity in a way similar to like hydropower i guess that is done right now if you had if you wanted to do that kind of a winding up electricity but you could use magnetism to generate that field that lights up the mercury right. i don't know if anyone's done this but i would think that you could get like a horseshoe magnet that was strong enough and have that on the outside of some vessel that is clear that's containing mercury and if you could get a strong enough magnetic field that might make it just glow i i, I would think so so that's like free free lighting right yeah <laughs> Why are there, we doing that there was an encode in the first uh star trek reboot in 2009 you know when they redid it and they showed you the red matter you know and they took the, the red the mercury drop. The, the drop of the red matter out and just one drop, you know, used incorrectly caused an implosion. And that's, that's the real juice is like the, you get the bioelectricity from implosion. And what did they implode? They imploded Vulcan. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah. Yeah. So they were they were that was a huge truth drop I, I thought that was a great remake i thought they did a really good job on it well that's perfect because that's kind of where i wanted to riff to i didn't great. know about that star trek movie and or is this is the newest one no the old the 2009 okay okay not the newest one but the newest like C trilogy when or whatever they rebooted, the hell it is. like uh when jj abrams took over the helm and yeah i saw that but i didn't know any of this stuff back then so yeah <laughs> but okay the fact that the planet vulcan gets imploded with this red mercury with red mercury fits yeah. exactly what i was going to describe which was the possibility that the antiquitech 
natural earth grid of architecture working with ley lines and generating electricity from the ether what if that network was a huge like realm wide i wouldn't say closed circuitry system but like open circuit system that because electricity is flowing through it or life force energy or prana is flowing through it in a a way that's designed with biomimicry mm -hmm. and the way nature does things what if that generates a consciousness field just like life force energy in our vessel in the shape that it is in creates a consciousness it's an individuated consciousness of us yes right so what if the vulcan that got imploded <laughs> what if the vulcan that we still that basically seems to be the root encode of all the other gods and goddesses and sun gods and chronos mm -hmm. and what have you i'll keep coming back to this arc pata this uh great artificer character you know what if that was the being that lived sort of the ghost in the machine inside the world grid and it was also the thing that was like their AI that they could call in the cloud, so to speak. And it gave them information like a channeled being almost. Mm -hmm. This is a bunch of high octane speculation, but I'm thinking that, you know, maybe there, maybe something like that was partially how ancestors figured out some of the things they figured out how to do was they're talking to, maybe they're talking to this entity through the crown <laughs> that they're wearing on their head. You know, standing in the middle of the building. This is, like I said, very, very wild and new idea, a speculative idea. But I love it. And I don't know. I'm thinking of like basically like was there an ancient, more organic AI, or maybe it wasn't good. Maybe it was kind of ty a tyrant. Maybe it had to be destroyed. I don't know. Just thoughts. Yeah. To Topher, did you say that was the first episode in 2009? It was the first. Yeah, I think it was the first reboot. Okay. It's where they reintroduced all the characters and like uh -huh. totally changed the timeline of it. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I think it was 2000. I was down in Costa Rica, so I only saw it on a bootleg DVD. I didn't see it. In the <laughs> but um, so, I, I can totally riff on this for a second. Uh, yeah, go. So something that I get a lot of value from is um, I have not read it. Uh, but I've learned about, I'm like a cliff notes master. There's so many books. I know what it says, but I have not done the legwork, but Moses and monotheism by Sigmund Freud puts forward a theory that I get a lot of mileage out of considering uh, that the uh, Yahweh of old ancient Yahweh was a God of the volcano. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, uh, Vulcan is essentially who has many other names. Hephaestus, mm -hmm. uh, Ambidexter is a cool name for Vulcan. Um, but he believes that the, the Old Testament is based on a volcano god, essentially. Mm -hmm. And that's a really rewarding uh, thought. And I get a lot out of seeing things that way. But I've, um, so you say it was the first episode. Mm hmm. Uh, so they love first offerings, that first fruit, that initiation. Right. It's a, that's the cap. And, and the whole gist of the movie was they changed the timeline. Right. The oh, whole shit. what the made effect. what made the movie so good was you had all the characters, the original characters, but now they were not attached to all the old scripts from all the old movies. Right. Now it's like, okay, you got the same characters that you know and love, but mm -hmm. now you can do it totally different. Right. It was genius. So this is this gets really obscure in my thinking, but uh, I have also heard that uh, some remote sects of uh, secret societies hold a history and even have charts and uh, uh, maps of the solar system with a a missing planet inside the orbit of Mercury. And its name was Vulcan. Ah, I didn't know that. And this makes amazing sense because Vulcan is next to the fire. Mm -hmm. Vulcan works the forge. Vulcan would have to be uh, burdened with a lot of heat 
Mm-hmm. You know, it fits the 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 concept of a uh, blacksmith, a god of the blacksmith. What was really another thing with the red mercury was I was really studying the the Nazi bell um, yeah. because I I had come across I had gotten a, a series of books that were connected to Victor Schauberger. Yeah. Um, Victor Schauberger was was essentially kidnapped by the Nazis for a few years, and they took. They took him and under duress, they had him share his Wolverunner technology, his vortexing technology. And then all of a sudden, you know, people are seeing these uh, Foo Fighters. So I was like, you know, from 2006 through like 2012, like I was just like shobbering everything. And so I got this group of uh, books, a series of books that were from, they were, uh, they were deciphered from German into English and translated, not deciphered, excuse me. And it was describing the, the Nazi cosmology, like how the Nazis actually saw the world and what physics they saw the world under. And they were completely ether physics and their model of the, of the realm that we live in, they described it like Swiss cheese. And the way they said it works is like, we're the, what we know now is like, we're in this one bubble of Swiss cheese and what we think of as space is completely solid. It's the, it's, it's actually completely inverted from from what we knew. And now back then I was a I, I was a globalist. <laughs> so I was trying to like frame this in my mind. And now I know a little bit more of what they're talking about. And they say the way you travel from one bubble of the Swiss cheese to another bubble of the Swiss cheese is you change your frequency. And their whole thing was frequency is location. And that's what the Nazi bell was all about. They took this mercury, this very special mercury, and they would vortex it and they would like get it going and, you know, running like a a monorail. (laughs) And they had these massive, massive coils that were like embedded into the earth. Like it was like, I forget the, the actual diameter of these coils, but they would essentially just run this this mercury as fast as they could in a circle and then all these weird weather phenomenon and all these things were recorded because this was in poland this was in the german annex part of poland and all these are really incredible things were happening on the front of russia from a weather perspective what a lot of people thought were were nuclear weapons i don't know where you guys are at with that but um I don't necessarily believe the the stories around how nuclear weapons are are uh, sold to the public. But yeah, that's where I'm at. Tot- they're totally misdescribed, whatever it is, and I could totally see it being just a big pile of TNT. Yeah, and the whole thing with this is the reason why I bring up the red mercury and then a different timeline was. They knew, they also said in their cosmology that, you know, frequency is location, but location isn't bound by time. So location and time are kind of one and the same? Well, you like, depending on how, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm making the leap here. The way I interpret that is that the more refined you could get with your frequency and maybe the overtones and undertones, you could actually change that location and timeline. You could be in a different, you could be at that location in a different time, not necessarily this time. Because I don't. So the way I would interpret that isn't that you could go forward or backward in time, but that your perception of time would change with your frequency. I say that just because of, I guess, uh, expanded consciousness experiences I've had where it's only been a couple of times in my life long, pretty long time ago, but that I got sort of stuck 
<laughs> I've gotten stuck in a moment before. And I don't mean like, oh man, this just feels like it's taking forever. But like I watched every like people around me moving in super slow motion in like a looping pattern. Yeah, yes, there's psychedelics involved, but that's something that changes your frequency state. So I don't know if I consider past and future to exist even so much right. if there's just the the current state <laughs> as it's flowing. But your, you know, maybe what part of that wave of the current flow of life force energy and existence you're at, maybe it feels like it's moving differently or at a different speed, right? Because there's like in currents in water mechanics, the a w part of the top part of a wave could be moving at a different speed than the undercurrent, right? Right. But it's all moving together. Right. Right. I see what you're saying. I and guess like, water can kind of flow, swirl around and make yeah, yeah. it go. It can loop, <laughs> you know, but generally yeah. they, they go in one directional flows. Well, the way to just expound on this, just, and I really want, I need to lean on your guys' uh, knowledge of comic books too, because I know you guys decipher all the DC universe and stuff like that. Did you ever watch the movie Hellboy? Yes, sir. Okay, so the original Hellboy is centered around, you know, this Nazi crazy, um, whatever you call it, they're doing some sort of seance <laughs> with all these SS officers, you know, Dr. Death, you know, right there, and they summon in, you know, this hell creature. A right? red bull. A red bull, and they're doing it in a circle with, and they have these big stones up and then they have the the ring that's bisected just like the nazi bell right behind it and yeah. what do they do they bring into the world this 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 demonic force right and then yeah. i was to you and stavely and what a great interview by the way chance that was awesome and he's talking about all these new things in the timeline now, you know, these 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 germ like specific German things like, you know, there were oh, five man, you're blowing my mind right now. I already see where this is going. Okay. There, there are 500 ships that have been sunk off of North Carolina. It That's total bullshit in my reality. My grandfather, my great grandfather, not even my grandfather. My grandfather on that side was actually a nuclear physicist, but my mother's grandfather was on, he did mine sweeping in the Atlantic Ocean. And Papa, he was alive when I was a little boy, and he was so proud of the fact that the Germans never, ever, ever got anywhere near our coastline. And nothing ever happened in, in our on our side of the Atlantic because he was on a minesweeper for three years. And so now they're saying that there was what, how did Stavely uh, talk about the, uh, the amount of boats? What did he call that area off of North Carolina? I don't remember exactly what he called the area, but I'm still reeling from the fact that a million pounds of TNT I know, was detonated in New Jersey, over, such over, a big explosion that like, it damaged the how, how could you Statue of Liberty. How could you even move a million pounds? Well, That's no, he said that it was like uh, our munitions were already there and they blew it up. But still, still, a million pounds exploding of, of dynamite would actually resemble a nuclear explosion. Yeah, that's a one megaton, right? That's what a megaton is. Yep. Yep. Mega means million, doesn't it? I don't know about that. That if you're, that sounds like pretty good podcast bro science to me. <laughs> I accept it. I think mega is million. So I think they blew up one. They had a one megaton. Because they, they always, you know, the, 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 they measured it against the amount of TNT that it would take to cause the same amount of damage. So Because they're yeah. really just TN using TNT to begin with. <laughs> right. <laughs> and measuring right. how much damage it does at a certain amount. So look at this. So I know, I know, I mean, I know you guys riff on this anyway. But the, the whole thing I'm thinking is, you know. And by the way, I know people, I know clairvoyance. I, I've known people that were really, really, really in tune and in depth in the psychic world. 
And a few of them had told me that they had these these like really strong feelings that the Nazis that uh, one of them actually wrote a book sort of like the man in the what do they call it? The the Stephen King book, the man um, in the ivory tower. Is that it? Yeah, something tower where they give you the alternative history of the the Nazis winning. (laughs) And then I had this, I had this guru once talk to me and like had this whole book written. And he was like, yeah, you know, this just came to me, you know, the Nazis won the war and this, that, and the other. And at the time he was telling me this, I thought it was crazy. And then I had another shaman from South America tell me, he's like, yeah, yeah. When I tune in, like, yeah, that's not, there's, there's something going on with that. There, there's, there's an energy there. So the where I'm going with this is I've been mandala affected. <laughs> I, I'm not immune to that. And these stories, like my the way I remember history is very different than the way history is being presented on many different fronts. <laughs> And so for me, I'm like, these guys show us everything in media and media. You know, they show us, okay, here's here's the red matter. Here it implodes Vulcan. It changes the timeline. It does this, that, and the other. And everything since 2010 has just been a fucking shit show. I mean, give me a break. You're here, man. Hallelujah. Oh, there it is. Philip K. Dick, man in a high tower. And by the way, Philip K. Dick. Have you guys like listened to what he had to say about this existence? Like Philip K. Dick's like way. Yeah, but he was a dick. (laughs) (laughs) His way. I have heard what he has to say. He talks about basically simulation theory type ideas. But he's so real about it. Like when he's talking about simulation theory, he doesn't sound like these, 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 um, unnuanced people that I hear a lot online now. He was dealing with the existential dilemma. Like he literally did not want to believe in in that. He did not want to go and feel like he was in a different timeline. He right. Did- His whole thing was that he actually came, thought he came from a timeline where the Nazis won, right? And now he was in this one. Right. And but in all of his books, well, not all of his books, but in a lot of his books, he felt like he was actually in an alternative timeline where that that was actually occurring. And then he had two guides that would always that he thought were just aspects of himself in other in other times, which I've met shamans that that's the way they say it. They say that their gods are just them in different in different times. I love this. I buy that. I've guided myself in different times. In yeah, and if you think about it, once you have your sovereignty, like once you're actually, you know, you're in jurisdiction with your creator, you would all like that would create this loop current. Well, okay, so what? About, how is this for a far out idea? What if the Nazis did lose the war in the timeline originally but planted the seeds and knew the physics of how to manipulate the past retroactively through changing the consensus realities belief patterns and opening a crack so like philip k dick could be the first one to wedge a crowbar into the historical model by being like i remember a timeline where the nazis won and then people are like what what does that mean and now they're putting mental energy towards like a timeline where the nazis won and then i don't know (laughs) <laughs> it's like a domino effect. Right. No, and that's the thing with the egregore, the egregore that's created through the quote unquote fiction. But I'm not thinking like what this is the thing. What was given to the mass, the masses about the description of the science that they were using was so so off base. What they were using never got to the public. And so I'm actually of the mind of thinking that they actually did in physical, in this physical existence, they did actually come across Antiquitech or they recreated some Antiquitech 
And just like any good tool, you could use it for for the benefit of people, or you could use it for you know the harm. And who's to say? And where my mind went with it is like, okay, say you got the keys to the kingdom and you're like, oh, well, let's just bug out. Let's just do our own thing. We know exactly what to do now. And we'll give them Werner Von Braun and his bullshit Saturn rockets that don't go anywhere. <laughs> you, we'll give them Mangala. We'll give them all these punks that, that don't really matter. We already have our, our fall guy and Hitler. Go for it. Because we know the people that really run the shit, we will never know their name. So well, when you study at least what is available to study about Nazi Germany and even World War One Germany, I'm thinking that there, the question of who won is a moot point because it, behind the scenes it was the same side playing both kingdoms. And that gets back to Doctor Nancy Banks's book. That's the whole point I'm trying to say. Is the, is the technology that, that the masses have no idea about was completely hidden. So for me, I actually think there's some reality to the fact that, okay, we know that they had Schauberger's Vortex technology. We knew that there are Foo Fighters, that anytime a Foo Fighter came in contact with any plane, that those planes would just, all their electrics would, would go out. We know that there were all these uh, weather and temporal distortions that were occurring all throughout uh, Northern Europe and on the on the Western front of Russia. Um, I don't necessarily subscribe to everything that uh, Joseph P. Farrell says because they really go down. He really I've read like four or five of his books and he really he's. I, I, I just don't feel like there's a, a true clarity of, of um, I think there's just a very strong bias in one direction with his work. But historically, what he's able to chronicle with the technology that they had relative to what the public knew is absolutely amazing. And I also subscribe to my own personal, my own personal or private experience of frequency is location. Like nice. their 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 model of physics was absolutely so elegant and beautiful. And I'm of the mind, you know, a few of them figured it out in the back end. We knew it was a, a banker war anyway. The bankers had to had to kill off a certain amount of the male population in Europe and in, in North America. So that was going to happen no matter what. And they got they they went down to Argentina and, and Antarctica, whatever that is, and just, you know, continued with the with the tech. Is uh is frequency the is it a hermetic principle? Mentalism corresponds. It is in terms of the law of vibration. It's with vibration. I would say that the hermetic law of vibration is referring to frequency. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Everything yeah. moves and vibrates and wiggles. Yeah. And one massive thing that, that Tesla showed us was that frequency and oscillation are completely different. So oscillation is on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. So, Whenever you have an oscillate, whenever you have something that can oscillate, that actually induces extra energy from the environment. Whereas a frequency is is almost like a um, a carrier wave. So oscillation, what they found with the the Antiquitech or the those things that would be considered over unity. They all have some sort of oscillating characteristic. It's like our our heartbeat is not a frequency. Our heartbeat is an oscillation. It's literally the electrical potential expanding, collapsing, expanding, collapsing. It's on, off, on, off, on, off. And every time it turns off, there is a cavitation that draws extra bioenergy into the system. 
Okay, this puts my mind in a really weird space, but I just got to say it because you've just set the stage. Makes me think of when they canceled Pluto. They turned it off. Mm. And then they built it up for a period of time, and then they turned it back on again. Just in time for Pluto to return, to Pluto's return from the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Mm. And a Wait, so they do consider it a planet now? They turned it back on. But that Whoa. on and off, uh, Pluto does that. Pluto, you can see it. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can't. It's so far away. You can see its effects, but you can't see it. So you have to use its effects to, you know, whatever. It's so obscure. But it comes on and off and on and off in its own right. So that's just neat that you said that because it. I feel that they have turned so it dude, on. Dude, you're going to freak out. So, okay. So this whole field of oscillation and cavitation. Yeah. This creates the the scalar transverse wave. So how you just described Pluto is how you can't really see it. You can only see it by what it the effects that it creates. That's the scalar domain. The scalar domain is yes. that which engineers what we actually see, but we never see it. Whoa! Makes me think of the osser. Oscillate. Uh, LR switch is really common between language. Osser, oscill. Ah. Osser is, it is uh, where you get the Aesir, which are like, you know, Odin and his gods. Mm. Osser in, I think it's Osset and Osser are Osiris and Isis. Those are two alternate names for them. Say so it sounds a lot like oscillate to me. That's cool. Yeah. Hmm. So that when you nip, said that like you have, need it, it's your hermetic principle. Oscillation. <laughs> <laughs> but when you said that frequency as location matches kind of your experience of reality, is there anything more you could say about that? Yeah, I did some training in, I did two, I had two modalities that had that principle wasn't said out loud, but that's actually what my experience was. So I used to channel. And so when I would channel, I'd essentially let my, my awareness of the awareness of this form drift back. And that would create a vacuum, like that would create an empty space. And then whoever was using me as the vector of their projection would actually animate animate my body with what whatever they were trying to vector in so what i could feel in that and when i used to channel like that was it was very easy for me to evacuate my body because of childhood trauma that i had had and at the time i didn't know i had childhood trauma <laughs> and i didn't know that's how how i had actually learned how to do this but uh yeah i could actually just I could, I don't know if bi-locate's the correct term, but I could actually just let my, let my consciousness evacuate my body and I could just see everything in front of me and then just watch it and watch whatever the projection of the other person was, you know, do its thing. And what I could feel in that was, that person's frequency was totally determinant of what would come through my body at that time. So that was literally like the frequency was the location, their projection. They were like, I could actually watch their projection or their frequency <laughs> onto me. And as an empath, I really feel that anyway. Like I I've had a hard time in my life having to um, field projections because i feel it so strongly <laughs> so a lot of my adult life has been like okay how can i you know shift that or 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 mirror it or ground it out right ground it out for sure yeah yeah that's what i ended up with polarity therapy that's that's the main way i do it but um and then the other way was uh i was being i trained a little bit um in remote viewing um, and I was very lucky because I got, I got to sit with the, the man himself, um, general Burt and the way he described how, how 
remote viewing really works, like how it works well, is you always have somebody that gives coordinates and then you have the, the evacuated person. And um, they do that for multiple reasons, but the, the main reason is the coordinate system works so well because the person that actually is, you know, translocating their consciousness to what wherever that translocation gets completely muddied if their own frequency or their own projection is in in the field so the person that gives the coordinate has no idea what that coordinate is and the person that's receiving that coordinate as a mirror, they're then at that point, they're, they're an array. They're, you know, we're, we're two or more gathered in my name type thing. Mm -hmm. They become that array. And then that consciousness can go to that by, by locate or translocate to that position. And what general Burt was telling me was that, you know, the only people that they found that could do that out of all the people in the military that they were having go through their system were people that had died, that had an NDE Great. and had seen UFOs. And by UFOs, he just meant saw extra lights, like people that had the capacity to see extra light. And so um, the combination of those two factors really limited the, the candidates that could actually um, successfully do the remote viewing. But in that, specifically to your question, it was about like, how can I get from point A to point B? Or how can I be in point A and point B? And it's really, I think it's, I mean, Chance, I think your tuning forks teach you all about this, right? Like you, you can tune people wherever. They don't actually have to be in your physical. There's actually a lot of advantages to them not being in the physical space. <laughs> right. Because then you're not, then you're dealing with a coordinate. You see what I'm saying? You're not dealing with their projection. Oh, um, okay. So in the remote sessions, it's, it's very interesting because even though I don't have a physical body there, I do create sort of the transceiver out of crystals. Right. So there is a more than one, there's like an empty vessel there that's part of the equation, I guess you could say. But I feel that the intuitive knowing comes in just as strong. Although at the, really interesting at the uh, festival I was at last weekend, I came up with a new way of dealing with quick tune-ups that are taking place in a loud, noisy, busy, very distracted location. So the the thing that I realized was that no matter what part of your path you're on, pretty much, you're always like, there's always one chakra area that you're developing, one or two, usually, maybe sometimes two at a time. But, you know, that's like a chord. <laughs> you're developing one or two at a time maybe three, but most people are on one specific one. So if I ask my dowsing rods, which, uh, which is the one that we need to move a blockage in or energize or stimulate now, they'll always just answer one of the chakras. It's like really, it's really sweet. You can program the question like that. Because before I'd been using them just to measure the width of each center of their energy field. But now when I ask it for just show me the one to work on, it doesn't really bother with trying to give me a specific range. It's like they all they all are the same full size until I hit the one that is the one I'm supposed to work on. And anyway, uh, in about five to ten minutes, of they can even be standing up. After I pinpoint the one spot, basically one sweep from the left, one sweep from the right, and columning in front and back of whatever energy center it is. And they have like a big shift right away. <laughs> it's like pinpoint laser aura surgery, even mm -hmm. in a loud and busy place. And they were telling me things like, you know, if I was working on someone's sacral, they could feel their stomach clench and unclench and clench and unclench, like the physical tension energy releasing from the sound. Mm -hmm. People would be like, I can see it behind me, even though I can't even hear the fork because it's so loud around here right now. Had their eyes closed but like it feels like there's a flashlight coming up behind me 
really cool stuff like that. <laughs> So what it made me kind of think about was in terms of universe being a big song, one song universe, that if we are developing through our chakras and each type of sort of mental spiritual level up, we go through almost like weaves through that wheel and we're doing it in our own order. Like you might go throat and then sacral and then crown and then root and but someone else goes in a different order and those are all associated with musical notes or maybe you hit two at a time, like play a chord. Uh, those notes constitute a melody and the rate of your growth and expansion and the order of your own melody through the chakras is like you playing your body instrument in the jam session of universe and expressing, you know, a unique melody. I thought that was really cool. That makes me think of the Enneagram that you brought up earlier in the solfeggio notes, you know? So you have the, that's just like a two. Oh, yeah. It was in the Enneagram if you look at it. Yeah, exactly. So that, that, that's really neat that you bring it up that way. I also got this really cool Laramar. Oh, yeah. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Yeah crystals you, you work with crystals a lot i bet you do tover no no i'm uh i'm a mason <laughs> i have my hand in in a lot of cement and air creed and phoscrete and uh i do a lot of stone work and i i really love feeling all the different types of stone um but when it actually comes to crystals i'm a real novice i've had I've had girlfriends that were really into crystals and I could always feel um, I could I could feel them. I can really feel magnetic currents, too. Um, but I, I'm not educated in them at all. I don't I don't know what corresponds to what. Yeah, even what you would get out of like a crystal book, you might want to do your own field research on. But that's a that's a fun subject. I got to talk some about that with Dr. Bear Lando in a recent mm -hmm. interview I did that's not out yet. Enjoy that, people. Coming soon. But I'll hold up on the crystal subject and back us to something that you can talk more about. I think there was a misconception in the chat and maybe with people generally when you're talking about General Bert, because it sounds kind of like you're saying bird. And everyone knows about Admiral Byrd, but you're no, talking about no. General Byrd, right? Can you talk about him? Maybe specify no, more of the work you did with that guy? It's General Stubblebine. His name was Albert, Albert Stubblebine. Albert Stubblebine. And the story he told me, and I believed him, like the movie uh, Men Who Stare at Goats, like the, that adaptation of, of the story was to like defame the work they were actually super successful <laughs> you know the, the whole spy game was he told me that they were running at like 15 percent success rate with the spy game by the by the way by the um I, he i think he was he got into that in the 60s because he he was a tank commander and by the 60s tanks were obsolete all tanks and with the way warfare was going, he had to kind of find, <laughs> he had to find a niche. And, um, you know, his, his mentor, his upline was like, I forget what tank commander in World War II, but was just like the man, like the guy that helped Patton take, you know, North Africa and all this stuff. So this guy, he was he was up there in the military, but he was finding himself, you know, being obsoleted and somehow, some way he got into, um, I don't even know what they call it in the army, but they essentially got into special ops and they were having a really hard time gathering intelligence. And so, um, yeah, they were running at like, you know, 15% success rate with the spies that they had. And at that point, uh, they were very aware of the different radio frequency technologies, the different scalar surveillance technologies that the Russians, you know. And by the way, when he was telling me this, so this was 2009, 2010, 
at the time I was still framing thing from a nationalistic perspective. So even though he was the very first person to bring up uh, Agenda 21 and Agenda 2030, and he and his then wife, uh, Dr. Rima Labo, they were flying all over the world in protesting the, uh, the advent of Codex Alimentarius that the UN was passing. But he was, he was essentially saying that um, they needed to figure out right quick how they could gather intelligence. And they, they were essentially given the proviso to, to look, look in any nook and cranny that you could. And I forget how exactly they came across. If I remember correctly, something about one of his field scouts, the guy that was helping, that was like the, he said it was the best terrain guy ever. I think he was a Native American. And they talked about how um, they could, they could, they could essentially do like a walkabout in their consciousness. And so they really started to explore that route. And that's what ended up becoming the, the whole program around uh, remote viewing. And he, he was 88 when I met him, 87 or 88 years old. I absolutely love the man. And um, I knew he was embellishing like a lot of his stories, but his heart was so his heart was just like so open. <laughs> he was just such, it was such a, it was such a contrast for me. Cause at the time I was like a vegetarian hippie permaculturist that was like, you know, very judgmental against the military and all this stuff. And then I meet this guy that essentially developed this program that really was about expanded consciousness. And he was really coming from a place of saving American lives. Like he really, he, he hated the fact that so many spies were dying. So like all these movies, like, uh, you know, uh, the James Bond and all the La Femme Nikita and all this stuff, like international spies, you know, Austin Powers. <laughs> it's it, so much of it's just su such embellishment because like the, the surveillance technology that they've had and the capacity to track people has been, it's so underestimated, you know, in the common world. So they really got to the point, he said by the eighties, they had even the ability to monitor uh, remote consciousnesses. Like they had gotten to the point where um, like, even if you were in a bunker in like, you know, <laughs> at the bottom of Cheyenne mountain, um, there were consciousnesses that could, that, that could come. So they actually had, they were trying to develop. And then he was, he was uh, dishonorably dis. I don't know if he was dishonorably discharged before it happened, but he said, by the time he was leaving, they were doing counter counter moves like they would have people be meeting in the psychic space, like literal wizard shit. <laughs> this is Dr. Strange. Yeah. Yeah. Bowing in the etherical. And what was cool for him with me was because I I came at all this from I lived years in an ashram where I was already channeling. And then I had told him some horror stories that I had with spirits that lodged in my body and like, and so I could speak that language with him because in, in the consciousness realm, that's nothing new. Like in the Raja yoga world um, that I was exposed to for like eight years, that none of that was, was even, it wasn't a big deal for me to hear. What was the big deal for me to hear was the fact that, it was so well funded and so well known about and so well practiced and nobody ever talked about it. Like at least not in my consciousness. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's when I refer to general Bert, I, that's, that's how I talked with him. And that's why I say his name that way. That is a good example of how just tons of people can be involved with something and it still doesn't get talked about. Yeah, like it's very yeah. possible. People were oh, conspiracy. That's a conspiracy theory. We would know if that was happening. 
Yeah, right? but maybe not. And yes. what you're describing is fascinating too, because I remember researching this subject and they would literally have like d dummy filing cabinets <laughs> trying to like put people off the course and that they could actually detect almost with an alarm system or even booby trap a certain ob uh, like astral objects or items. And uh, one of the things that I actually had an anecdotal explanation of by somebody and I've told this story before, but I once met a guy who claimed that when he was doing a lot of acid, he met in the psychic space, another person, but who was an occultist and that they communicated and then decided to meet somewhere and they met in that location and they had never communicated in the physical realm before, but they both, both met at the location that they specified in their astral communication at the time. I totally, I totally agree with that. And I, I know through these two modalities that I had practiced that the entire psychedelic realm is populated with synthetic experience. That is a really good way of putting it. And I think even synthetic substances carry are the vector of the synthetic experience or spirit. Even, even, I mean, I've been around shamans that serve their own homegrown, like with, with, you would never call their their substance a synthetic, but what I call synthetic is when you modify your consciousness, when you, when you're making an idol out of a uh, altered consciousness, you are now entering a synthetic realm, and so so many people idolize the psychedelic realm. And they've known for a very long time how to populate every frequency range of that, whether it's the machine elf realm, whether it's the, the carpenter realm, whether it's the, the uh, what is it? What's the, the carpenter realm? The builders, like the, they call it, um, when I came across them, they, they call it, they're the, um, God, it's been so long. I'm trying to say, I'm trying to use the right terminology. They're above intention. They're essentially what I would call the vector for for the scalar domain. Nice. They're, they're what engineer what we experience in this realm. Um, so... All those, I don't think any of those, I think I think some people can have an organic experience depending on their intention. And, you know, life is specific. So not to generalize too much in this, in this regard. I had been a part of many, many ceremonies where the ceremony was absolutely being monitored by an AI consciousness and the, the field was being populated with synthetic with synthetic messaging okay so when we're saying synthetic messaging would that be another way of describing that be like artificially created synchronicity uh no i don't look at it as that benign like it it was not that the, benign okay but i mean i think i've experienced what you're talking about in the terms of there being synchronicity that is your inner outer world reflecting in a way that is helping you get closer to finding something out about yourself that you're you're leading yourself towards and then there's entity induced synchronicity that creates kind of like a wild goose chase a wild loose chase <laughs> where you're on a pathway for loosage yeah yeah, and then also the deep messaging. Like, so you can have MK Ultra in somebody's altered consciousness. They pretty much have figured out how to MK Ultra everybody in the psychedelic realm. Well, that's how the psychedelics got proliferated. And I even think that part of the reason for that is so that whenever expanded consciousness experiences maybe happen naturally, spiritual experiences naturally, that it's like, oh, they're just tripping out on drugs or psychedelics. And it almost is sort of like the placebo effect. Oh, it's just a hallucination. Oh, it's just this. We have a name for it, so we don't need to explain it or investigate it any further. But it's an old human ability, ancient as, as ancient as we are, to be able to 
experience different bandwidths of the frequency spectrum. Right. What I'm trying to say is I deal with a lot of people that think it's always an organic experience. What they do is they think it's valid because it's unique to them. They're under the novelty fallacy. And that novelty fallacy really, really makes them, puts them in a naive space where they're unprotected. And so I've had to, I've had, I've, <laughs> I've had a lot of um, resistance. To novelty is even a word for fiction. <laughs> right. It's a. Uh, you know, it's so, and I, I, I get it because I, I had fallen for it too. And I, and I still fight against naivety in my own consciousness, but I really, once I started to really understand a lot of the experience, especially um, in the ayahuasca world, I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is being bought and sold. This is a completely I shouldn't say completely because there are authentic people in that realm, but like this is a this is an an engineered environment that is very welcomed by the globalists. That's the best way I could say it. You know, OK, so the, the why, <laughs> the why, the why of this? Well, because it teaches monism. And that's the, the the whole thing with monism and the whole thing is like in dealing with those communities that, and I've, they're such well-intentioned people, but the whole notion of we're all one and always trying to, to come from this space of we're all one, at least from what I can tell in the male consciousness, a lot of times eliminates men standing up to other men that are um that are troublemakers there's there's too much leash that's been given in these communities and there's too much naivety so you have these really open people that are really looking for something else and it makes them so susceptible to just being you know essentially pushed in any direction Gabe. Really... <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so monism spelled A M A N I S M is defined as the worship of deceased humans, ancestor cult. And the uh, tangential words in the Merriam Webster dictionary that are entries before and after monism, one of them is the Isle of Man. Damn. Damn, that's nuts. You're going to have to explain why that's crazy. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Okay. Well, I want to I want to say something about whenever you look something up in the dictionary, everybody, look at the words that come before and the words that come after it. Yeah, it, it's, it's crazy sometimes. Always be sure to find its dictionary neighbors because there's there's a lot in that relationship in, in the order. There's a reason for that order, and you can learn even more by looking at the words around it. So Isle of Man has been on my radar a lot lately. Uh, big love to Carrie out there. I know you're watching. Uh, we've been digging into this Isle of Man mystery for a little while. It came up in, um, I was doing a breakdown on uh, Laura Croft and Tomb Raider. The most recent Tomb Raider movie was filmed. Uh, in relationship to the Isle of Man, I think there were scenes on the Isle of Man. And the Isle of Man has the very interesting flag. And the flag has been really uh, getting a lot of attention. They were in the headlines with COVID. They kind of put themselves on the map in a major way during the lockdowns. But their flag is like a three, it's literally three legs spiraling in the Truscalian. And... Uh, there we go. Thank you, Chance. Yeah. This is their flag. In uh, There is so much going on just in this. And it's really hard to like pick a place to start. But I will state that the Isle of Man is outside of the law. They are like their own um, sovereign territory. When the queen comes to the Isle of Man, she ceases to be a queen. 
she becomes a lord. Hmm. She goes through a gender switch by simply by virtue of changing location. Frequency, mm -hmm. mayhaps, right? Yep. One other thing that's interesting about that is it is that it's got the yod, the y, the, which uh, I always think of that as a hidden hand. And there's a whole mystery riddle behind that. But um, another thing that I'm thinking about is how the swastika was four, four right angles, right? <laughs> and what I see here is two different calendar systems. The swastika is the four seasons of the year. However, there was a calendar that has been lost to consciousness, maybe intentionally, maybe obfus obfuscated. And that calendar was a three-season calendar. It's called the fasty calendar. And so the relationship of the four-pronged swastika being a four-season year and the three-legged swastika being, a and I think this is why C is number three, C is number three. Suns, the seasons are the three suns, the three types of season that uh, the year uh, goes through. And there's. Uh, and when we it, switch to a four season zodiac, you yes. get the four royal stars, which are Scorpio. Uh, what, what is the four? Scorpio, Aquarius. Leo, Leo Taurus, Taurus, which is salt. So it's like when the Roman calendar came in, they salted the earth <laughs> and the salt is a seasoning. We're talking about seasons. Right. <laughs> yep. And I, I, I think so the old, the old calendar, the fasty calendar is a beautiful thing to just get uh, an appreciation for days a through H it was an eight day, eight day week. But they didn't name them after gods. They named them A through H. And it was 40-day months, uh, nine 40-day months, generating a 360 circle. And this is why we have 40 days as a cuarente, quarantine. And there are so many things that we do around that 40, that number 40, that venerates this old fasty calendar system. And this is episode 40, and there's 40 people watching the stream on oh, YouTube. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. So 40 days is, this is the word veneration. Vena is Venus. Ratio, the reasoning, the, the rational proportion. The, this is all giving uh, logos to Venus. So a 40-day time period, that's Venus's retrograde cycle. So Moses being on the board, boat for 40 days, 40 nights, that is all giving veneration to the metrics of Venus and its expression as it goes through a five-fanned or five-petaled uh, flower uh, in the heavens. And this is where the word fan relates to Venus and its, uh, its fans. It's, uh, it's all venerating Venus. In the way. temptation of Christ, when he goes to the desert and is tempted by the devil, he's fast, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. You're talking about the fasty calendar. Fasty. He's fasting for 40 days. The Lucifer-Venus connection, it's all there. It's pretty cool. And I, I have a theory that this calendar is is special in its uh, it's reserved. You could think of it as a jealous God, maybe, that, uh -huh. that only prefers its uh, its chosen one. And I mean jealous in the textbook definition, not envious. Jealous God. That is an important distinction, the difference between envy and jealousy. Um, so theoretically, this system, this alternate calendar is probably still up and running. Uh, it's probably still receiving veneration from certain individuals. And it's really something to think about that the Isle of Man is waving that flag around saying, ground zero. <laughs> and I know Where Topher, you meant Mon monism as M-O-N, not manism. Monism. Right? Yeah. Monism, which is the we're all one cult, which is, you know, the current 
issues with the new age movement are exactly the same as when the Vatican was created and the empire switched to this bastardization of the, the mysteries that they call the church. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the, there was a quit, a strict quarantine of the knowledge from the uninitiated against the profane, but the Vatican Roman empire, that church represented the creation of a new, a new initiatory rank, which is like almost lower than the, the low, <laughs> the lowest rung on the ladder, which is where you get all the scriptures and uh, you take it all literally as history and you lose all the allegory and metaphor and you think that you know everything and that's what the masses did. Mm. And the, the ruling class was happy to do that because having such a misunderstanding and bastardization of an inversion of truth like that is something that definitely makes you easier to control. Ironically, the, <laughs> but it's being it's putting forth a, a monism idea in a lot of ways, just the way that the new age does today, that it was like, um, you know, you're all sheep, so you're all the same in a way. Mm -hmm. And the I look at it like, of course, the I think the Christos is, is the life force energy, you could say the real thing, the animating spirit, not the historical or whatever the living man the living man but and that the life force is ether and the ether is one and doesn't really have a location frequency is location it's like the frequency that the ether is uh perturbed at is what creates our experience of location but since ether is mental energy in a sense it's like explaining how distance and separation are mental and conceptual things but as individuated vessels of life force energy that each carried around we're not exactly the same because we all have a different frequency so the oneness thing is paradoxically true and untrue at once but if you're too far polarized which is actually feminized to the all oneness thing you wind up with communism and then in Dylan's new book, Dylan Sicosio's new book, A God's Acre for the Winds of the Soul, his uh, fourth spirit world book, he flat out says <laughs> Christianity is communism. And then he goes on to, oh man, he goes he goes in on it, but I, I'm not explaining it in its full glory, but that's kind of the gist of, you know, the monism thing, because I know that wasn't what you meant whenever I brought up the whole worship of ancestor spirits. But when you look at the monotheistic so called monotheistic cult. Well, mono, like, monotheism and monism are not the same. So no, no, they're not. But the uh but the Vatican does do like the ancestor cult type worship. I mean, they they're super into necromancy and bones of saints and all that weird stuff. You want can I drop my definition of science real quick? Yes. Defin my definition of science is science is a seance. We <laughs> are we are evoking the names of the dead men of renown so that we can uh, determine future outcomes. Yeah. And so the scientific formulas and experiments of the past, we call upon that experience. We bring it into the present conversation and we agree that because we see it the same, we can now make a predictive judgment call. What's up, Cheney? Hey, this conversation's so great tonight. Yeah, um, nice. Were you guys talking? I was coming in here, so I heard the 40 days and 40 nights. Were you talking about Ascension Day? Oh, but thank you. Okay. So here's another 40 for you. After um Jesus, you know, he gets crucified, and then three days later he comes back. 40 days after that is when he actually gets taken up to the ascension. Like he's alive for 40 days which I, is something I never really heard of until like the last week. Um, but the Ascension Day is um, tomorrow. Oh, my shit. So I just thought it was so weirdly timed um, oh, on shit. the time. I love you so much. About timelines and everything that I just thought. Okay. okay, hold on, hold on. This is where fine, fine, la finish, the finishing touch, the last aspect. This is the finish line. Fine, 40. Uh, Venus, 44, being uh, uh, the old Hebrew alphabet goes to 22, and then it's complete, 4. 
It's done. It's the end. Finish. Finish line. Something big coming tomorrow, y'all. Maybe it's the end of all racism. (laughs) (laughs) the The Isle of Man has a famous race, a very famous race, and 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 it's crazy. But I'm quite convinced it's called the world's most dangerous race. I think they're indicating the most dangerous game. I think there's there's some hunting going on on those uh, on those islands that they are uh, putting in plain sight and only certain folks can see it. But I'm pretty sure that's what's going on. And if you saw the Laura Croft Tomb Raider thing, it's all in there. It's baked in. But that is awesome. Hunger Games. Yes. That's what they're doing. And well, they all sidereally, have- we're in we're in sidereal Taurus, which is where Orion's at the hunter. Just throwing that out there. Oh, nice. Hunter, Hunter Biden. Yep. Uh, the and hunters H- become the hunted. Hunger uh, Games is an HG. That's Mercury, HG. And the bird that they're all wearing from Lady Gaga to uh, Paris Hilton's mom, like they're all wearing huge birds on their lapel. I don't know what it represents, but it's hu- all the people in the Hunger Games have it too. And then she's, uh, her name in it is like, you know, all the Hunger Games books are like Mockingjay and all that stuff with the bird mm-hmm. logo on it. Um, so there's might be something there. Hmm. It would be cool to do, to find the Enneagram. Okay. So recently I've come across, I've got a lot on my mind. I'm just going to share a little, little <laughs> morsels of it. He called me for like two hours last night. He had so much. I got mind. so much going on in my head, guys. It's so crazy. And it's so hard to keep it linear. But so I'm looking at the Enneagram in an, in an interesting light. I have discovered that we have this, uh, ambassadorial relationship with other countries. I'm going to look into this more, so I'm just starting to figure this out. But I'm learning that France is uh, has a, rela- a relationship to America that puts them basically in the number nine position in the Enneagram. And there are other countries that have a, a relationship to us that's official. This is a standard. And so uh, I'd have to dig it all out and I'm still piecing it together, but France uh, is a number nine in the Enneagram. Uh, The other countries have their stations in the Enneagram as well. So number nine is peacemaker or balance. It's shadow is sloth. And so these other countries fall in their stations around the Enneagram. And I'm just getting to understand this system. Wouldn't it be cool if there was a bird that corresponded mm. with each country and their relationship on the Enneagram. And uh, I'm still unpacking this concept, but wouldn't that be neat, Cheney, if those birds were uh, countries or families that correspond with a- Well, it goes into like the eagle versus the serpent thing again, like where you start getting into the Anki and yell, uh idea where the, all their symbology is on every flag or every country always. So you either have the uh, eagle or the serpent and right. representation and how right. the, our country was not supposed to be eagled. We were supposed to be turkeyed, which is interesting once you go into like the Turkish crescent and how it's still representative on so many of our flags around the country. But I bet how you're like France has a special spot in our country. So does Turkey. Like somewhere we're attached to these certain few uh, and I don't know what it, it's because it's not just royalty. There's something about the space. There's like a keystone between the two or something. I want to correct gonna... myself too and uh, say Orion is in Gemini a lot too, which is the current sign we're in. It's a big, Orion's big. But hey, Inky, you brought up Inky. Is it like this ink <laughs> ink oh. jar that the, the bell is in? The bell bowl? Mm. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's cool. This is amazing. So not see bell. Exactly. Not see bell. Did you not see the bell that is <laughs> on the bill? The $100 bill. Very good. So I did this. I did this on the week. Well, speaking of 100, Gabriel, if you add the, um, I, I, I could be getting this slightly wrong, but I know I'm pretty sure it's like, if you add the gematria of fall, summer, winter, spring, it comes out to a hundred or something like that. There's a couple of ways that in the septenary uh, phrases that describe the four seasons 
or the four Royal stars come out to 100 in geometry. Wow. And this is the $100 bill you're, you're pointing out. Right, right. So Taurus in the most simple of gamatrias comes, uh, comes out totals at a hundred. I think I, I think I sent a gamatria to, to the, uh, call in, uh, in the, here we go. So the word Taurus has a lot of really interesting, yep. The most simple of all the codes, it comes out to a hundred. So there's your bull on the bill. Your bowl on the hundred dollar bill. This is the bill bowl. You know, this is getting really close to a lot of words and a lot of ink red to bowl concepts. <laughs> uh, well, inky was 50. So the buy bowl, the two bowl, maybe is the hundred. Nice. Gemini. Mm. Yeah, that whole that whole uh weave was really fun. You take that uh the not the bell. And you break it in half, and then you switch left for right and put it back together, and it's it's got the image of the bull. It's the bull's figure. The figure of the bull is on the money again. This is why Christ flipped the tables on the on a money changers, because they were putting Hathor on the bill. Hmm. And this is why Okay, this needs a little more explaining. So if you take yeah. the broken bell yep. and you Cut and paste. Cut and paste one half to the other half. Basically, like, put the left on the right and the right on the left. You get That's this it. bowl shape. Yep. And it, uh, that bowl shape is uh, it's very clearly Hathor to me. Those ears are signature ears. And Hathor's ears, we're told that those make her a bull. Those are the, Because her ears look like that, she's a bull. Now, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to disagree. I think this is depicting the process for circumcision. I think this is excess foreskin pulled forward and uh, in preparation for a cut. This is the tool in the top, right? This is what the tool looks like that is used for circumcision or even castration in the yes. ancient world. And so this symbol... Just like the shape of her hair here. Interesting sink there, this, Gabe. The word symbol goes to branding. The same bowl. They put a brand on the bowl so you know who it belongs to. So circumcision is symbolically putting you in a cast. This is the ration of your cast. This is your, your, you're marked. You've been marked as an animal. And it's amazing how many aspects of social Darwinism, animal sacrifice, all of these, what are very openly satanic concepts. They all funnel to this bull worship. And here comes my man, Mario. <laughs> hey, dudes. You're talking about circumcision. I have to join. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Yeah, I want to hear from, from Topher and Chaney and, and you, Mario, on this very, this very subject now that we're on it. That's a good call, man. That does look like that. And actually, I've been following this guy on Instagram, and he's decoding a lot of circumcision uh, symbolism in like some of the earliest decks of the tarot. And it looks exactly like what you just pointed out with her ear, pulling the foreskin so that they can actually uh, do the cutting. So that's totally in the magician. Guessing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. Wow. It's everywhere, man. Have you so you've seen it? The the card that he's referring to? No, what it looks like when they're about to do the circumcision. That's too oh. morbid. You're no, yeah, I, I think I've seen like that. diagrams and what have you. <laughs> hmm. But it, it's definitely a thing. So I'm I'm starting to realize that uh symbolically, you know, it's in the um magician's hat as an example. So you see this little his the top of his head. But then the hat is kind of coming out. And so it looks like it is the foreskin being pulled. And then the magician is Mercury, which relates to the pole and the post and a lot of phallic energy. Right. So it kind of makes sense. And then he was even pointing out some stuff um, regarding Mercury's wand that looks very phallic and uh, circumcision like. So now I, d I just want to point out that when they when they convince mothers to do this. Uh, or whoever, when they convince your family to do this to you, they tell you it's for hygienic purposes. And this is amazing what how it's not a lie. 
how that's not a lie. Like it is about cleanliness. Of course, there's an aspect of that. But high genes, that's so synonymous with you genes, eugenics, high born, the well born. All of these are basically just more aspects of a caste system uh, that it's crazy. So it's not what I'm getting at is that the, the excuse they make for chopping baby dicks is sci it's science. Oh, it's science. It's for science. It's religious. It's, re it's ancient religious practice. Uh, yeah. and, that's, and that's what we're really bringing forward with this Zodiac Dendera, the Dendera Zodiac with the chopping off the bull's leg in the very center, the place entered. It yeah. is also, it's all symbolic too of the current cowpoke stuff going on the the vaca <laughs> vaca means cow in Lex in latin right you're talking about hathor uh, and we got so much further deep into hathor and the uh the author <laughs> the the ai egregore that may be uh ancient of days and manipulating humanity but aside from that there's this recent thing that came out from geert van den bosch who was a virologist and cowpoke expert who worked for Gavi and, you know, Bale Gates and his husband, uh, her husband, Melissa, right? So they have this guy come out now who's saying that they're going to, the, uh, the, those who've been cowpoked are going to have big problems without going into the why of it, you know, he says they're going to have big problems and big die offs are coming and they're going to get more sick than people that didn't get it. But he said the reason was that the cowpokes needed more sterility. Anyway, the point is that we know that these things are, it's about ster sterility. <laughs> Absolutely, it's about sterility. Bill Gates has been saying that about his uh, campaign to get more shots in arms for uh, over 20 years, probably. Mm -hmm. So, castration is a sterilization. This is just a different method to go about it. Yeah. And I think the cast thing you bring up, Gabe, that's really important and significant. And I think you're totally spot on. And I just recently learned that uh, a lot of Vedic priests come from a specific caste, and that is the Brahmin. And then the sacred mm -hmm. bull of India is also the Brahma bull, right? Mm -hmm. And then we have the ox in the tarot and all these different things. And that's a castrated bull. And then we also kind of relating to your Isle of Man flag. That's really fascinating, by the way. I think there's a lot to decode there. But the foreleg or the thigh of the bull, Ursa Major, revolved around the North Star. And so when I see those three legs in rotation, it just reminds me of the same symbolism. That what if it really is Ursa Major, but in three different positions around the Only North Romy Star. Romy calls your dick his, your third leg. <laughs> you know, it, it, when you said the third leg thing, I was thinking, is it a solo leg? And then could you even go with the hangman being castration? Because he used to being hung by his one leg. Could uh, that be symbolic to the same kind of thing? Because why the one leg? Exactly. A lot of one legged symbolism has to do with this. And my understanding has to do with this pivot or rotation. And so there's various myths where someone loses a foot or it's injured or they have one shoe or sandal or something like that. And supposedly it has to do with the rotation around the North star. And, and wouldn't it like the same as losing a shoe or sandal being losing just the tip? Mm, oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Good one. Sure. It's a moil. It's all it, it's in a witch world. The more I, we have this joke that like the hardest ingredient like we run it with each other when we're just being silly like what would be the hardest which ingredient to find and the harder your ingredients the more intention go in for the path and then your spell would be more powerful because intentions everything so we mock it and we're like the hardest ingredient to find is octopus tears <laughs> like that is the hardest ingredient but then we mock it like maybe the whole ocean is just octopus tears maybe you've just never made an octopus cry and so we have this whole joke about octopus tears um, this being said, in an ingredient, if you were to say, bring me the tip of a virgin man's penis, 
that is so powerful. That is so huge. So then you go the younger, the younger, the younger, this thing's in a certain hours old, this thing's a certain days old. And then if you take something and you're like doing a whole ritual around it, usually in some kind of golden bowl, water and the certain tools that are used, and then a rabbi will stick it in his mouth. What is that all about? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I just talked about maybe Topher's got some uh, awareness of this fact, but go ahead. No, this is all just making me think of the Kurt Kallenbach work with the whole thing with the separation from the placenta and you know the creation of the straw man, which ends up becoming all the you know the leverage that's needed to create securities. So yeah, this all kind of ties into that with me also you brought up um the whole thing this whole thing the bull symbolism and the calendar of dendera were any did any of you ever study john lamb lash's work yeah i'm familiar with him but i haven't studied his work or read his books that's what yeah, i'm at i've really, checked him out he really broke down the the calendar of dendera and the way he he showed the I forget what surf company it is. It's like the Hurley where they have two women that are like, you know, sitting back to back. What's that, Cheney? Oh. You're mute. The H symbolism where it's like almost two ladies with a line. Yeah, through like, it it almost looks like Hurley. Pisces. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking we were talking about H symbolism somewhere like on the spiders in the last that I'm like, the H. <laughs> yeah, he was showing that that's actually... Um, it's actually in, and I saw this when I was in India, that's actually the um, exact way the fallope, I don't know if they call them fallopian tubes, but the way the, the reproductive aspect of the cow looks. And so he was tying that to the calendar of Dendera and the whole the whole uh, changing of the ages. And I, I'm probably massacring what he was talking about, but this is kind of like jogging my memory back to, to my studies of him. But I, like this whole thing with the, the tip of the penis, like if they already separate, like they, they get you with one cut and then they get you with another cut that makes you, you know, from their perspective, like a complete in, indentured servant. Like, right. like that's what you are. That's the cast that you're in. Yeah. Chance, can you pull that up for? Yeah, bingo. Does that look like it at all? It does. Yeah. Holy shit. That's yeah. nuts. That's interesting. Uh, because this, this is from the movie Doctor Strange, the bad guys are summoning the uh, Dormammu, the super demiurge from the dark dimension. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this is the symbol that they get marked after they do this symbol they become marked right I, 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 I just want to say that Topher did not watch my videos before he said that and he totally came to this on his own and this is where my current arc of slick dissonant work is coming to so Topher you land you landed right where I am in my thoughts just oh, great. <laughs> good that makes me happy that's awesome uh, what it reminds me of is that shape, right? It looks like the center of a toroidal field, right? Yeah, it's a hyperboloid. Exactly. Taurus. Taurus the bull. Yeah. Yeah. I want to also point out that I was talking to Bear yesterday, Lando, and he has apparently done microscope experiments where he took blood from a person and then had it under the microscope and recording while different things were done to the person whose blood it was mm -hmm. nothing bad but like different energy healings exposure to different types of sound light vibration things like that if i'm remembering mm -hmm. correctly and that the blood changed as things were being done to the person whose blood it was mm -hmm. so i'm thinking it would work the other direction too if they have dna material the cut material as kurt kalmbach refers to it it's huge. I gotta tell you, we you don't, you'd have to close the door for that to not work anymore. Yeah, I mean, we, even think about druid druidism. <laughs> druid means door. And is it because they've got a door to the people, the their servants through this branding? You know, you put the logo on it, and now it's got the connection to whatever it's from. 
Well, think about, they say like a lot of the UFO abduction stuff is, you know, people, uh, it's the way that their mind um, interprets the what happened to them in the hospital during birth. And I think that there's some real truth to that. Like, uh, like I, I had extreme hospital trauma as a child in what an alien environment to be in. Like we had our daughter at home in a bathtub. Like it was just this beautiful experience and we kept the placenta and we let everything on that end of it kind of go its natural course. What a different experience than from actually, you know, having some doctor smack you in a cold, sterile environment everybody masked up like and then getting oh it's like it's so alien to even think about like it, it's your baby's even... super cute and really enlivened <laughs> yeah she's alive yeah she's out she's at the door trying to get in she's like <laughs> so um yeah this I think... brought up by d even to die in a hospital is alien yeah. yeah, dude, these, these, they got you in the white coat. The white coat guys got you whenever you come in, and the black robe guys got you when you go out. So, this is actually how our whole conversation started. We started talking about, you know, um, the book AIDS, Opium, and Diamonds, and the whole, this whole white coat, like the, the, the energy behind the energy, <laughs> like, you're being experimented on. You're our property, whether you like it or not, until you actually, you know, stake your claim and, you know, declare your correct jurisdiction. But like that, that's how this whole thing, that's what this whole, you know, branding, the, the whole mark, marking, like all this stuff is, is uh, sort of in the same vein with how we started the conversation. Just think about that. Mar King. <laughs> Who's Mar? Right. The ocean. Right. And Zeus turned into a cow to seduce uh, somebody in Ovid, some lady. He lured her into the ocean. In Is it Pasiphae or something like that? Maybe. maybe. That's interesting. Pasiphae? Oh, actually, yeah. I think she maybe uh, was lured by another uh, cow story i could be wrong oh, okay. <laughs> that is interesting uh so i've i've kind of come across the this number nine peacekeeper the ball lance oh, the it lance was europa ball. is who he was see he was seducing europa europe oh wow that is he's a hottie <laughs> uh oh oh uh raping it was your raping. He was raping Europa. That As is. a whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Well, your guys' symbolic knowledge would be, you can elucidate on all that stuff. I'm I'm totally lost with all that. So one thing that Elsie King has brought forward is the fact that INC, like incorporated, right? Incorporated could be also interpreted as ink operated because it is written, so it shall be. You're agreeing to the authority, and he has taken the INC, the incorporated, mm. which is the ink, right? That's the ink, and you do the septenary, and it's a one to one for VAC, vaca, and so the vaca scene. You are signing to the incorporation. You are signing on to be incorporated. And this is nothing people don't already suspect. Mm -hmm. But I'm just pointing out that there's a linguistical, gematrological course to take to prove these words out. That people who signed on to the vodka are now operated by the ink. Hey, sweetie. They're obligated in a, in a major way. And I like to point out, too, that there was a time where nobody believed that somebody could own the earth in some location. There wasn't such a thing as place in the legal sense that we have it now, but eventually that concept was 
you know, drilled into people just the way that body autonomy is uh, the, losing body autonomy and your body being property of the state as well is the next right. thing. It seems inconceivable to us, but yes, the direction it's going, that's not going to be the case. People will believe in that eventually. I want, I want to riff real quick because this brings us full circle where we started. This is something I wanted to say earlier. Now I got, it's open again. Michael Wan has, has gifted us all in one of his recent videos with this idea that something that we come up against with the, the Mondays or the, the NPCs, something we, a wall that we hit often is uh, Occam's razor. And a lot of people love to cut their perspective, to limit their perspective of reality by just writing off things to Occam's razor. Michael Wan has made a great point that Occam's razor has no place in the kingdom of man, in the, in the realm of, uh, of humanity, because humans can lie. Mm -hmm. And the fact that humans can lie separates us utterly from all the animals. And that means I see what you did there, razor utterly. Has, utterly. <laughs> nice, nice. Yes, so Occam's razor has no place uh, within human social constructs. And this also point, brings to light a very profound fact that lies create hyperdimensional realities. Yeah. And that's why Adam well, and Eve got kicked out of the garden. Of lower potentials. Of lower potentials. Excellent. Yes. And that is the labyrinth that we are trying to make sense of in this whole conversation this whole time is the fact that we live in a, 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 a lot of people are in the castle of mirrors that is constructed by lies and creates a hyperdimensional reality that most things that uh, like Occam's razor, it just doesn't, ex it's, it has no place. It's useless in this uh, hall of mirrors. And when uh, Baudrillard says media, Medea, the, the witch that hexes, cast hexes and illusions on Jason and, you know, the Argonaut captain, when Medea, it creates realities that are hyper real or more real than real. When he says that media does that, I think what he means is that basically you have the, the lie is already in, in instituted in the minds of people. So when the media creates that continues to resonate to that lie and repeat it over and over again, that uh, it makes people disassociate from actual reality yes. from the real existence. Because when they see what, when they see what's real it, with their own senses, they now are like, this feels wrong. This feels off because it doesn't match what they've been made to believe. So whenever he says that media creates a reality that is more real than real, he means that to the people that are indoctrinated, the media feels like the thing that's real. And so it's more and more attractive to go towards the, the metaverse and the digital because your experience in the physical consensus reality doesn't match up with your fictional narrative of what is and isn't true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love how they did that in the show American Gods. Did you see that show, how they represented Medea? Oh my God, it's masterful. It's so good. It, like she's, she talks about that. She talks about how her reality, the synthetic reality is more real than real. And the story she weaves is, is, is better than the reality that most of the mundane live. It was just the way they depict Medea is incredible. Is she, I'm looking at, I'm Googling it. Is she the one that looks kind of like David Bowie? Uh, she changes depending on the age that she's in. She's um, she was Scully in um, the actress. It was Scully from um, whatever you call it from Next the X Files. Yeah. Okay, I never actually watched American Gods. Oh, dude, that's that's right up your alley. You yes. got to do it. It's a good one. He he layers so much into yeah. everything. Uh, uh. I'm only recently starting to like use this term uh, hyper sigil. And I like more, that term. the more I look at it, the more I realize like that's where everything is hidden. 
You know, the, the, they, they take these meanings and they just compress them into these characters, these artistic experiences that unfurl slowly. And weeks, months, years later, you're like, oh, that's what that was about. Right. right. Yeah, American Gods is great. Yeah, I'm bummed. I'm bummed that they don't. They're not completing it. Not completing it, but like, it, it's a it's a worthwhile watch, especially with your guys' symbolic literacy. Like, it's it's excellent. I, I think they're not completing it on purpose. I think so too. It's the same reason why they're not completing uh, the OA. Like, did you guys like the show The OA? Loved it. I saw the first season. Yeah. Oh my god, the OA is just. It's I mean, chef's kiss. I know you talk about truth drop after truth drop of how this reality works. Mm -hmm. It is exceptional. Is that all the it, time? Is that what it's called? The OA? It's called the OA. Yeah. The it's original. So, yeah. yeah go on. I, I'm not even going to say what it stands for, but it's it's worth an in depth watch. It's so tedious. It's a tedious watch, but it's worth the tedious. The silence makes you, your human want to pick up your phone and fill that space with something, but you have to watch everything because the details matter. And they matter in such a way because it is kind of like this multiverse idea, but done in this really real world way. And um, they even deal with like ideas of heaven and hell and uh on this life and the different lives you might live with those two things. I don't know. It's too, I don't want to give anything away. So it's such a vague topic to talk about. Um, but just one of my favorite lines in the whole thing, it won't give anything away. Um, and uh, what's the lead dude's name? Uh, who's named after the, it's something uh, like, it's not Gulliver, but it's some, like some name like that from like a big uh, some, Oh, fuck, I can't remember his name. But he, so he's in this like different realm and he keeps having this reoccurring dream, reoccurring dream over and over again, reoccurring dream of himself in a tunnel. And he wakes up and he's like, oh my gosh, I just realized it's not a tunnel, it's a place. And so like just in the 3D realm of like crawling through an air shaft and popping through like a tile, it's like that idea almost of death. Like you're being drawn to the white light and then, oh my gosh, this isn't a tunnel I'm on. It's a place I'm in. And it's just like that concept of alone of just, it's not a tunnel, it's a place. And it's, that's how big the idea is though of time and space in this. It's so good. It's so well done. Even the way they, I don't want to get, I don't want to say it's so good. It, it, it is an exceptional show. It, it, it is so worth your time. And, um, and, getting back to it's on it's on a higher octave i would say than than um american gods you know american gods was a completed thought from from the author neil neil gaiman this this you could tell by the by the way this the trajectory of this show they were actually revealing how how to how to harness your frequency, therefore harness your location. Like they, they were showing how to create the circumstances, the, let's say the scalar fields for your enlightenment. Like it is awesome. And if you are special or touched or gifted or your gifts are starting to show, there are people out there searching to harness your energy right. and to figure out a way to steal that ability. They, they, there's like, you've figured out a way to use your Ouroboros and they can't. And so they want to harness that. It's such, it's such a crazy concept and it's done with like kids and part of it. Like it builds it up. Like the first season, it's like sporadic and like all these people from well second season to i don't know you just really have to watch it this would be <laughs> I, everything feels like i'm gonna give away like a big part of the be quiet already yeah <laughs> okay it's one of my one favorites and no one's ever you know the google synopsis just because it was an interesting thing it said that the main character was bl blinded but could still see that's a really yeah. lame way of describing it 
Well, I find that interesting just because it was a big topic in my chat yesterday that's still not out yet, of course, but I keep referencing it because it keeps connecting to this talk. And I'm not even driving this talk. <laughs> but the uh, thing I talked to do with Dr. Landu, I talked to Dr. Landu about this whole uh, being able to replace physical senses, physically damaged sensory apparatus with the spiritual version of it. Mm hmm. The way that in like deep meditation practice or if you leave your body you can still see and hear yeah definitely and being able to still like have completely damaged and scarred up retinas and eyeballs that shouldn't function but learning how to see spiritually and functioning that way because mm -hmm. i think in the more original or natural state we were operating on both levels simultaneously and we've kind of been lured and tricked into just thinking our only ability is the interface through the physical body filter which is really a filter more than a sensory apparatus we you know we never actually stopped doing the spiritual version of sight just because the components of the eyeball were broken down and analyzed and we have the anatomy of it that never actually told us how the hell an image is appearing <laughs> in our consciousness right mm -hmm. it's just it's like everything else scientism does uh, breaks it apart, labels it, but and says that that means that it's been explained. And there may be some mechanisms that can be, you know, understood in terms of how processes unfold, but we're never really getting to the the primary cause of of qualities and experiences through scientism. That's no, right. There's my rant on that. Yeah. No. Exactly. One example, since you brought up the eye, is the idea that our eyes project as well instead of just receive light right which is what we're taught in school and so there's that um and speaking of eyes kind of uh topher you said that uh you're a mason by trade like i i build i'm a builder yeah. so yeah. yeah yeah have you ever gotten interested in freemasonry or that symbolism um given that or, I, or i've given familiar? a little bit like back in the day when i had my podcast i i had I had befriended um, Tracy Twyman okay. <laughs> and, and she was really, she was really jockeying for me to go down that road. Cause I have a great, great grandfather that was a, what's it called? Um, a Knights Templar. So I think oh, yeah. of, that's right up a rally. I, I think a lot of my life has been um, working out the karma <laughs> of my family um, but, and it's really weird. Some of the things that I just kind of innately know, I find that very odd. Like my wife and I joke about it a lot of, a lot of times or some sort of weirdness that was passed through the line, I guess. But, um, yeah, I, I really love looking at the, what do they call it? The board, like, and seeing the two pillars the tracing boards the tracing board and then understanding you know the 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 ladder you know the the ladder that's you know the hidden the the third pillar uh i think that's i don't know any of the fine points i will, won't ever pretend to know what yakim and boaz and why the black and white and all that and how many checkers there are i don't really know any of that stuff but um I do really understand in my heart of hearts that there is that I'm under the understanding that we we are in a free will realm and the truth does set us free. And to me, when you go from one polarity to the other polarity, and if you can somehow navigate those two polarities, you can find the uh, free will pillar and ascend. Like I, I do think that's a I do think that's a, a possibility within our yeah. that that's that's my projection onto the tracing board. I don't know if that's what they mean by it. Mm -hmm. No, that's interesting. I'm glad you brought that up actually, because um Freemasonic symbolism has been coming up a lot for me lately because we're now in Gemini. And so it's just interesting as an example, you know, the the Gemini symbol it's roman numeral two essentially or it's those two pillars mm -hmm. and then you're going to see the freemasonic g you know a lot of times within those pillars or within the compass and square and then um i've been talking about it um to a few friends you know online lately but 
the Babylonians considered Gemini season to be strongly connected to brick making. And it was even called the brick mold. And so there's this very strong Gemini aspect as to bricks and therefore masonry, right? And when we're talking about the Gemini twins, you know, a lot of times they're brothers and the Freemasons call each other brothers mm -hmm. and everything. So there's this whole brick sort of rabbit hole that you can actually go down symbolically, which is fascinating. And so, so you'll laugh at this. Like today I did a consult with a new client because I was trained in super Adobe. Super Adobe is flexible form rammed earth construction. So it's literally like where you take clay mixed with sand and you put it in a flexible form and you ram it into place but because of the binder that's in it it hardens into like a, a cylindrical brick <laughs> and so i was i was actually talking you know a bunch today with a with a new client about that exactly there you go the earth bags oh nice yeah so that's oh. kind of cool that you brought that up wow that's gorgeous they're yeah. like beehives. Yeah, they're the beehive dome. Okay. That's neat. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah, that looks like it's at Cal Earth. That's actually where where I learned. That's that's in Hesperia, California. Cool. I just, you know, random Google image search. Yeah. Psychic thing. Yeah, that's a neat structure. So uh, Kaylee brought up something really interesting in the chat regarding a Freemasonic eye doctor. And basically, there's this place near Portland. I'll show pictures. And it's called Oculus Anubis. And people were trying to figure out what this place is all about. Oh, snap. And so I wish these photos were a higher resolution. And I actually, I've been to this location, and I have much better photos. But people had all sorts of speculative ideas about it being, you know, used for occult activities, uh, really unsavory stuff. People have all sorts of different stories about this place, Oculus Anubis. Well, people started doing research over the years and they found out it actually was kind of a location for uh, some lodge system, some mystery school system. Uh, but the history is that uh, the guy who started it and the people were who were affiliated with it were all uh, optometrists. And so it was almost like an optometrist. Oh, the, ocu called. the oculists, and they were a German order. Back to the Germany of it all. Oh, yeah? <laughs> nice. So anyways, when she mentioned that, I thought that was very interesting. And we visited this gate, and this lady out of nowhere just like came and was very awkward with us, but she had a GoPro around her chest so she was filming us as she had this brief interaction with us it's a really bizarre thing but you know tracy actually talks about it right but like different occult groups uh mm -hmm. based on occupation which i think is fascinating yeah butchers and optometrists and doctors mm -hmm. and masons and what have you yeah that's a big thing in the city of london too they have the like you know these real weird unions or like, I forget what they call them. They have a whole language around it, but yeah. Uh, a chance I sent something in the calling. Can you pop that in? Yeah, buddy. So this was a fun realization once upon a time. I realized, like, if you look closely, you don't even have to go into the Gamatria numbers down here because they are like a perfect overlap in a lot of ways. But if you just look at the simple, most basic numerical values, it's just the same numbers rearranged. So Anubis and Saturn are very, very correspondent uh, in a major way. Um, and I am a, uh, I'm an electric universe enthusiast, uh, a Velikovskyite, if you will. And I, I am of the belief that Saturn sat at the North Pole once upon a time. And so all of, a lot of people, you know, they, uh, the dog, all of the dog symbolism tends to go to Sirius, um, the dog star. Um, but I also uh, direct that interpretation to Saturn and the North Pole and the Pole Star, which is Mario's forte, for sure. 
Is it really, Jake? Is today really the exact anniversary of the George Floyd thing? Jake, you're a badass, bro. The, I mean, I, I talked about, about this on the show. In the Twin Cities, of Gemini, during Gemini season, and bricks, Freemasonry appeared. Yes. Holy shit bags. And tomorrow's ascension. Mm -hmm. And Obama uh, tweeted out today, like, oh, sorry about the school shooting. And remember, today's the anniversary of George Floyd. And I'm like, oh, yes, oh right. my I gosh. He's such a humanitarian. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Shut up. Cheney, where in Florida are you? Where are you from? The Treasure Coast. I, uh, okay. I live in Vera Beach. I wasn't yeah, yeah. going to say it. And then I'm like, I've been doxxed. <laughs> I live in Vero. <laughs> you can find my, it. You guys are all where, researchers. I grew up going up to Vero. I'm from Fort Lauderdale. My my grandparents lived up in Vero. Oh, okay. That's it's old people. It's a little old people nest, but a lot of my friends live down in Miami and Fort Lauderdale. So yeah. I frequent. That's where the Antifa that docks me are <laughs> fouled up. I bet. I yeah. bet. Miami's a weird town. That it is. Where we're going to need to go in depth on putting our heads together, maybe making a slideshow or something about merging your whole electric universe velikovsky saturn at the north pole thing with my cosmic egg <laughs> ring lands growing earth thing and i'm pretty sure we can make some sense of it well the you know the the nazi cosmology that i brought up earlier has all of that yes i think i think velikovsky might have been german i actually either that or swiss right? polish Polish? Okay. okay. I don't know, but ski is always a Polish. Um, that's all my Polish friends we call skis. <laughs> nice. Like yeah. Irish people are mixed. Like everybody has a, so yeah, Polish. That's kind of Russian. Stop that. <laughs> the skis never mind. They prefer that. I and I, the Polish must have been some kind of mental powerhouses because the whole entire world mocks them with Polish jokes. Mm -hmm. And so I think the like transmutation yeah. of everything is always the backward history. So the Polish must have been where all these crazy scientists came out of. And well, think about you got, they've got the skies and at the end of their name, and they're the poles. The poles. Mario. Mario. Poles. There you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pole star. Pole. Oh yeah. Right. Totally. And, and that's where Germany started. That was the initiation. Germany wants to know, Topher, what is a book or books with the Nazi cosmology. I'm interested in that too, because I would I say think, so part it, of the I, whole Nazi I, thing is to say that this is the Nazi cosmology when really this was like, this was just a cosmology that the Nazis got, you know, we got painted as Nazi as a way well, to keep us so that we don't see it, not see. So I believe it was spelled Arctos, A-R-K-T-O-S. There were six books, and I had only been able to get the first three. And as soon as I got to the point of their their cosmology, and because uh, at the time I was reading it, I was a globalist. Yeah, that's that. I think that's book one. I was wow. looking for it on Google, and I was like, I can't wait to show this to Mario. And Mario's like, the polar myth, Arctos. <laughs> <laughs> have you I read have it? To have it. I do it. I literally just got it maybe like three weeks ago, uh, but no, I have not read it yet. I've yeah. Heard so, so I got through the first three of those and I, then I ended up throwing it out because I was a globalist and it went against my, <laughs> it went against my primal conditioning. So uh, I feel like a complete idiot now <laughs> for, for tossing them. But it, at the time it was, it was pretty revolutionary in my mind. The one thing I really appreciated it and I got from it was the the ether physics side of it. And nice. As, as we were talking about, you know, frequency is location. And the way they talked about potential was exactly the same way that uh, Tesla and um, I, have you guys heard of Keeley, John Morrell Keeley? Mm -hmm. So Keeley was an inventor. Um, who I think he died in Pennsylvania, but he was the one that had drilled all these massive holes through mountains all up, up and down the East coast of the United States for the railroad companies. And he did it all through vibration. 
and he created this. Uh, I, I might have the book over there. He created um, essentially a spherical, um, I don't even know what you would call it, something with all the musical notes. So he had like a sphere within a sphere within a sphere. And he could turn and get get these certain harmonics and he could create total total harmony or total dissonance. And then he could take those waves and amplify them and essentially disassociate matter. And he was he was the tunnel borer. They didn't have these massive tunnel boring machines and there weren't guys with pitch axes you know, going through mountains back then, like this so guy really maybe just explained how the underground networks are operating. Pretty much. It also so, reminds me of the Globus Cruciger. I don't know what that is. It's if you the, remember oh, the um, the Emperor card we were looking at, how he's holding ah, the, yeah. the, the, cross the Holy the Hand Grenade. Come on, guys. Exactly. It's better <laughs> to just call grenade. it the Holy Hand Grenade. Yes. <laughs> I knew exactly what you are talking about now. <laughs> <laughs> so it, Keeley and Tesla and even Schauberger to some extent said that potential is solid. And so when I first heard that, I was like, like it was like so mind blowing to me. And that's what gets into the Arctos book. They talk about we're in this, like we're in a bubble. I, I like Ken Wheeler's way of talking about the electric universe. Like we are in the plane of inertia, the dielectric plane of inertia. And as you go out from the inertia, you get closer and closer to potential. And once you get to full potential, full potential is solid. So people that are trying to find like the, you know, the, the glass dome, like the firmament, it's not a firmament, you know, made out of Libyan glass. That's not what it is. It's literally the end of our consciousness and it's the transition zone from our consciousness and our potentiation to potential. And that's why it seems solid, but it's not an actual like substance. Okay, potent and sheol. Oh shit, sheol. I'm thinking it, potent shoe. Shoal shoe is close. Uh, right. Shoe is the Egyptian god that separates uh, Geb and Nuit. Right. The earth and the sky. Shoe right. is kind of like a, a demiurge character in that sense. It's the, you know, it's the that thing the that holds that's up, like apart. In, in bow that's like over everything. Holding the sky. Yeah, that's Shu. That's cool. What else did we figure out about Shu last night? I feel like we had something else, Gabe. But it's the placenta, that two-dimensional div flat dividing oh, line. Oh, right. <laughs> We're just talking about shoes. Just thinking, <laughs> yeah, because your feet, your feet are riding that, you know, it's that 90 degree. It's the only part of your whole anatomy that has that one plane to it. it also it, your it, shoe, your, your shoe is separating the earth and the sky metaphorically because yes. you're no longer touching the earth. Yep. Just like shoe, the God. Yeah. Ah, that's and, neat. Yeah. And I think this all uh, translates to the placenta in a major way, you know, that it, because the placenta is the, is two dimensional. It's a plane, it's flat and it's, ex, it's exchanged for paperwork, you know, uh, the placenta is huge, guys. Do you have so guys ever seen the placenta? It's everything. It's yeah. as big as the baby. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's the it's uh, the Gemini. It's the divine twin, man. It's your divine twin. It is. Yep. Yes. And, and uh, I I just had this kind of this thought recently, and I'm, it's on my uh, most recent series. But I'm starting to think of the Gemini and and the placenta, all of this as um, that we the chattel, whatever, the uninitiated from birth, whatever, whatever, are considered a two-headed monster uh, uh, because, and this could be the two pillars. This could be the, pr the principal primary split. This could be the first lie. And... <laughs> Sorry, this yes. comment is too good. If I live to my full potential, I'm doing the world a solid. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one, Cozy Crown. That's great. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. 
so yeah, that's kind of where we took the shoe thing is to the the fact that the uh, the placenta is like the first lie. Uh, the fact that like they consider your birth certificate is a living document. And uh, another definition for document is a collection of tissues with a common purpose. And that's exactly what the placenta is. The placenta is a collection of tissues with a common purpose. And that correspondence between the two definitions is where the switcheroo happens. And you trade that placenta in for your proof of organization. And there it is again, an organ, organization. It's amazing. So here, so I, I'm going to have to go in a second here, but this, I'd like to throw this out here for the Yeah, group. we'll we'll wrap it up. Let's have everybody get your closing thoughts in. This is but, what we need to so, get flow state time to start. <laughs> so this a, it's a supposed contract <clears throat> that we're unaware of the terms. We're unconscious of all of it. So it's not really a contract. And then once we actually take up correct jurisdiction with our creator and then counterclaim those claims that are against us and actually live that, that contract goes null and void, correct? What is the symbology that you've seen that's out there that represents that? Like what do you in 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 the different media that's been presented to you? Are you aware of them giving that kernel of of knowledge, or are you aware of them exposing that? We could probably find that in every Marvel movie. I would say. I mean, Gabriel, we we find the placenta baggage symbolism all over the place. You know, it has to do, it's like symbolic just in the very part where the superhero puts on their costume. Right. I think there's also uh, in that the title, uh, Our Gods Wear Spandex. Mm. Uh, by Christopher Knowles. By Christopher Knowles. Yeah. It's that, that's the spandex. That's the hero, hero scamos. You know, uh, erotic games between these deified characters. Uh mm putting on each other's clothes, switching roles. Uh, yeah, it, it's amazing what, where the placenta... Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah, I, I understand that side of it. I understand the side where they're, they're actually taking on an identity, right? But I'm talking about in the mythos, in the symbolic mythos in, in Medea right now, are you guys aware of the other side where they show the full representation of the living man or woman of, of somebody not, not putting on their cloak, but taking it off and coming into their full power by, by fully not wearing spandex by, um, I guess there wouldn't be much of a story in that regard, right? But I, I'm I'm trying to find in my own uh, media library the the closest thing that I ever saw to that was at the end of the first Matrix, you know, where Neo said, "You know," and he, he yeah. changed the game. He goes, "I don't know how this is going to end, but I'm going to tell you how this is going to begin." That that to me was a living man at that moment. And he was participating in both realms, but he was like, you got your thing. They got their thing. I'm doing this thing. You know, right. They had, he could go into their world, but they had no jurisdiction over him. That's right. a perfect example. It's one of the most cut, clear cut ones. Yeah. But other than that, and even that they had to totally destroy that franchise. Like, I'm just wondering in the current iteration of Medea, is anybody out there that's really like, coming with it i can't Great think question. Of any, yeah i can't think of any off the top of my head but that's a good example i like the neo in the matrix he's on a corded exactly phone. he's exactly. at a booth coming in his first line in that rant is i'm gonna put this phone down and then i'm gonna <laughs> but step and... one the initiation is put this phone down yep and also at the very end Right, he's at an intersection, 
which is the crossroads. Right. And then he takes off. So I think he like completely embodies Mercury and becomes the traveler between worlds at that right, point. Because and instead of going like forward, backwards, left or right, that the crossroads represents the 90 degree choices on the he's off the disc. <laughs> he's off the plane. Yeah, yeah. He goes up instead. Oh. Yeah. So good. So good. Yeah, I was just wondering if there's because I, I haven't seen any current movies lately, so I don't know. I don't know what's out there. I dig it. I'm going to take that as homework. <laughs> yeah, I'm Great. sure you're going to be drop, like having con seeing connections left and right as soon as we hang up. Have you guys everything everywhere all at once yet? Oh, no, not yet. I can't wait. Have you? Moyer told, told us about it. What yeah, I. Um, it's a movie. It's a total parallel universe because they seem to be really big on telling us this right now this is something they're pushing in the zeitgeist so much is that everything of multiverse madness. everything's crazy uh but it is done so well and it is done on like such a low budget you can tell it's done on a low budget they don't really leave the scenery very much the special effects are like they're good but it's not just it's not crazy cgi and um it's a woman creates a thing like a machine so that you can jump into your other lifetimes, but really just pull whatever knowledge from that lifetime into you. She figured out a way to like control it. So in certain situations, like if me and you were about to fight, I could jump over to a lif different lifetime of mine where I was a gymnast and you could jump to a different lifetime of yours where you were a professional wrestler and now game on like, but there would be little tricks in the world in this world to make us jump to those certain timelines so you'd have um like a marker or a, a switch so it, you'd be like oh let me pull gum off the bottom of this thing and chew it and that'll make me jump to this timeline but you kind of know what your switch is um so all your people follow you. That's throughout how lifetimes. alters work too. You might hear like rain or something and then you're boom. It switches you. Yes. It's that same switch. And so it, it kind of looks like all energies travel with each other throughout these parallel universes. And you have to, she is the one that's chosen because she's almost the one that's not good at anything. It's so weird. Out of all the hers that exist, she's the one that's the least tied in to anything cement. So she's the like malleable clay that maybe can pull all of them when the knowledge is needed. And so her life is kind of so depressing and so monotonous and mundane, like just this boring life. And then all of a sudden, you know, she's in she's a superhero but i don't want to give too much away the same as the oa <laughs> but it's really good and everyone should watch it it seems like one of those things you have to watch more than once or in two sittings it's great. long oh great thank you what's it called again everything everywhere all at once or everywhere everything all at once all those together in some order <laughs> i'm on it we're gonna need to decode that i, could, <laughs> I already want to say a lot about it and i've never seen it <laughs> so i'll hold off so uh, it's, uh, we're getting, we're getting long in the tooth for vibrant so we're gonna wrap her up and take our time going around the circle here and reminding everybody where each of you can be found and what you do and we'll just start with uh mario and then go cheney gabe and finish out with tober this was awesome lots of good topics i have some notes for things i want to follow up with um you can find me at symbolic Come studies back next week we got Juan. oh Juan nice joining us Cool, cool. I'm down. Symbolicstudies.com. Um, I basically put out information regarding each sign during the sign itself. Uh, so on my Instagram and YouTube and uh, Twitter, TikTok, I'm all over the place. That's where I publish my videos. I've got elemental study packets. Uh, you can name your own price and uh, have that if you're interested in the elements. And I've started doing tarot readings too. So if that's your thing, let me know. You can go to projectchaney.com and find any of my podcasts, or you can follow me at Chaney in Wonderland on Instagram, uh, Project Chaney and Chaney Project on Twitter. And I'm 
just um, holding a magnifying glass to the crazy reality and then trying to talk about it sometimes on my podcast with my own trauma healing and whatever spiritual work I'm on at the time and then hopefully interview a cool guest sometimes too. Excellent. Nice. Uh, Slick Dissident on YouTube. That's my channel. I also hang out with those weaving spiders pretty regularly. We're going on tonight on the uh, flow state into the wee hours, re <laughs> reading and making art. Uh, so yeah, Wednesdays I'm with the spiders and Saturdays into Sundays, I think we all go on to the uh, weaving spiders channel. So that's where to find me. Yeah, you guys got some stamina. <laughs> Um, it looks like according i'll say also about flow state it looks like jim has announced that there's a different channel for that so it's weaving spiders webs um not sure why that is but we'll check that out um i posted i'll repost the link he just posted so it won't be the same link as what's in the show notes for this yeah right now you guys can find me at bio charisma on instagram and then i think within a couple of weeks my website Topher HQ will be launched and uh, I'm re-upping the, the old podcast. I got a pretty good slate of, of folks on deck. And um, yeah, my, my focus with that is really getting into our, our free will influence on the overall cosmology. So yeah. Um, that is an interesting concept. The conversation we have with the archetypes where they don't just influence us, we influence them back. Yes, yes. I'm into a, it. It's a two-way thing. So, um, yeah, that's where you can find me. Beautiful. This has been awesome. Guys, I could keep going with you easily for another couple hours, but we'll just hop over to the Flow State channel. Weaving Spiders Webs now, new thing. Thanks everyone for being here. Of course, all four of you are welcome back to call in on future flows or uh, vibrance, whatever this is. <laughs> Thanks everybody for tuning in. This has been an awesome live chat to keep an eye on as well. Amazing. Thank you for making the last 40 episodes of the show so much fun. And I can't wait to see you all next Wednesday and watch out for the new interverse coming very soon with the homie Romy, where we're going to go deep on the uh, anti antiquated transhumanism theory he's brought forth with the crowns and the scepters and the holy hand grenades and whatnots. A lot of fun holy conversation. Hand grenades. <laughs> uh, three, sir, not five, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and of course, if people want to book with me for sound healing sessions or or Oracle cards, let me know. Get at me in the email, chance at universepodcast.com. So yeah, good night, everybody. Much love. Catch you all later. Good night.